Vigello may have voted yellow, but Andrea Dovizioso painted the town red. Welcome to episode 16 of Bike Live. Let's go! Yes, with the tenuous political reference out of the way, welcome to episode 16 of Bike Live here on Motorsport 101. We record this on election night, decision day here in the UK. Um, so, as the last uh, many, many weeks have transpired on TV, we're going to have a right good argument for the next two hours. Uh, here on episode 16 of Bike Live on Motorsport 101, I'm Lewis Sudderby and a warm welcome to all of you for listening. Um, to this show, as we look back on the Italian Grand Prix at Mugello, the duel in the MotoGP crowd, and boy, did it deliver. It delivered three Italian victories, uh, as Andrea De Vizioso, uh secured a victory for him and an Italian manufacturer uh, in the MotoGP race. Matteo Pasini took his first ever Moto2 win, uh, beating Thomas Lutti and Alex Marquez to do it, and Andrea Migno took his first victory in a crazy Moto3 race which we will not go even close doing justice uh, over the next uh, couple of hours. Basically, if we spent the entire show talking about each rider who fought for the win, we'd still be here this time next week. Um, but we'll do that uh, over the course of this two hours with myself, Lewis Sotheby. Join me this week, Andre Harrison. Welcome, Dre. Vote Dre for a brighter and more happy bike live. <laughs> well, um, he's not got it's not a one-horse race, though, this week for this one because uh, Dre is not alone because joining us once again, uh, it's what welcome back, Rebecca James. Hey, Bex. Hi, Lewis. Thank you for having me back. And uh, mine's a funnier version of Bite Live, so vote for me. <laughs> yeah, vote Bulliger. Sorry, vote Bex. Um, See, right. that's the thing. Once again, Bex has not showed up to the TV debate, so unfortunately, I don't think she's, don't think she's fit for purpose. <laughs> for, uh, for a more chaotic. I'm never fit for purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Vote Bex if um, if sleep is your priority, because uh, Bex is keen to get the shot the way, so she can go grab some Zeds, because um, she has a very busy schedule at the moment. Um, so um, to ensure that Bex can get to bed as soon as possible, uh, let's uh, get the housekeeping out of the way and tell you all the places you can find us. Uh, we are on Twitter at motorsport underscore one hundred one. Uh, if you want to follow us individually, it's at Lewis Sotheby23, at Harrison101HD, and at Beck underscore J93. Uh, on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash motorsport101. On YouTube, youtube.com forward slash motorsport101. Um, our website is motorsport101.net. And if you like us so much that you want to back us financially, you can do that on Patreon. Um, you can back us for just $3 a month this month and earn yourself early access to this show and indeed to the Motorsport 101 podcast. Uh, patreon.com forward slash motorsport101 is where you can find all the information on that um let's get into the italian grand prix weekend then uh, at Mugello. and um dre is the jewel in the MotoGP crown it is the race that we all look forward to perhaps more than any over the course of the year and we find ourselves saying this a lot now on this show which kind of tells us how great moto gp is nowadays but yet again this was a weekend where in all three classes the grand prix sure as hell delivered quality up and down the field and that, that's a rare one normally you have at least one class to craps to bed on, on a race weekend unfortunately but this time around all three races were tense they were gripping they were quality you know you, you you never really had a definite winner on any of the races until until the final lap um i'd argue especially like especially obviously in moto two and three but so uh, this was a very special weekend i mean again Mugello is a, a special race we talked about it last week and and it's it's Rossi land. It's the Italian fans are unlike any other in MotoGP. So their chainsaws, to their rare guitars. And um, yeah, literally. And like I said, like over 100,000 people there at Mugello there to cheer on the, the home nation. And, you know, a lot of them wearing yellow. And while his man didn't deliver, I don't think they'll be too disappointed at three home winners. The first time since Mugello 2008 that the Italians have won in every class. That I believe that was Rossi, Corsi, and Simoncelli back then. Uh, so, uh, yeah, not a bad day for an Italian job. Mm, yeah, you mentioned Simoncelli. We'll get to this a bit more in Moto2, but um, the time Pasini, who won the Moto2 race, um, it was a very emotional day for him because the last time he won a Grand Prix uh, in his career was around that sort of 2008 time, and uh, Simoncelli was with him on the podium. Uh, the last time that Pasini won a race, so he was very emotional uh, after the Moto2 race, um, which we'll get to a little bit later on. Um, but Bex, I mean, this is that sort of classic time of the year when we get to those great venues, the likes of Assen that is still to come, Catalonia this weekend, uh, and Mugello, it, it never disappoints, does it? Mugello always delivers fantastic action. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, it's, it's an absolutely fantastic track, and, and Dre pretty much hit the nail on the head there. You know that you're going to get superb racing, and I think for me, um, a race weekend 
is made even better by the fans. And for me, the likes of when you go to Italy, the Italian fans are to MotoGP what what Polish fans are to Speedway. They're absolutely nuts. Fanatical. But yeah. you can't like they're they're so incredible to just be around and their energy just sets the weekend alight on its own. I mean, you're never going to get terrible racing at a track like Mugello, but even if you did, like the atmosphere and the energy and the le- electricity that would just be floating around that place because of the atmosphere that the fans create, it would make the weekend worthwhile anyway. So I think it's probably one of my top five to go to in the world would be a MotoGP race there. But it's it's an absolutely outstanding track, outstanding fans, and you, you're always assured a fantastic Grand Prix. Yeah, it is a, It is one of those bucket list ones, isn't it? And I think Julian Ryder said it on mm. commentary on BT Sport the weekend that to any MotoGP fan, this is one of those venues you have to go to. Um, you have to go to Mugello uh, at some point. And uh, as Bex rightly mentioned, Dre, the atmosphere was extraordinary. It always is going to be whilst Valentino mm. Rossi is still in the field. But that's two MotoGP weekends in a row now where we've had... Um, a spectacle that the crowd has certainly added to. I mean, it's possible to have good races at circuits with no one watching, as Qatar has proved um, in recent years. But there's, there's no question that an atmosphere like that certainly adds to the occasion. And I don't know about you, but the, just the roar of the crowd within seconds of the lights going out when Rossi flew off the line and took the lead straight away, the roar gave me goosebumps. Oh, it was deafening. It was it it was ridiculous. Like you heard the air horns being played. It was like Michael Schumacher was in the house again. The, the Tifosi at Monza. It was it was bonkers. Like you, you like Rossi takes the whole shot um, in, into turn one. It, he got an electric start, and again the roar from the Italians because they're. they're there's grandstands like all over the first sector of the track, so they could all like eventually see what was happening. And when they saw Valentino in front. The reaction just said it all. Just unbelievable scenes. It was very special. And, um, yeah, unfortunately, obviously, it didn't work out for Rossi in the long run. But we, he, he had his moment there running at the front. And, uh, my God, they, they loved it. <laughs> yeah, you can't you can't buy moments like that. Just, just as they're coming down to Casanova Savelli, the, 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 the S's, and Rossi just comes through a sea of yellow smoke um, because they've already set off the smoke bombs down there. And, uh, and Rossi yeah. comes through it in the lead of the race. It was just thrilling sport just to just to watch that as, as Rossi goes to battle with Lorenzo in the early stages and yeah it was an interesting race in that respect in that it started off as, as Rossi versus Lorenzo at the front of the race and we thought we're going to have an absolute heavyweight battle here and it ended up being a battle between their two teammates uh, for the win of the race for the victory um, Andre De Vizioso and Maverick Vinales who fought up the front um, with um, some notable company um, from the home favourites which we'll talk about in a little bit Dre but as much as we said last week that this was perhaps Ducati's best hope of a win outside of Austria, um, that wasn't quite the race we were expecting to see, was it? No, and you know, it's amazing. I listened back to last week's show, and you're the one that called it. You said Dovi each way was a great shout at 16 to one, and I was like, I should have done it. And <laughs> like, I, 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 and, and then like as the weekend got on, Dovi just got stronger and stronger. And yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean. Not only the fact that Dovi won, which again is his first dry MotoGP win, which is you know I've, like we've never seen Dovi really run a race like that so comfortably. Just win one on pure um, pace. Exactly, Dovi's never had that in the dry before. Like he's he's challenged for the win in the dry, but he's never looked quite as comfortable as that. He was never really under threat the second half of the race. He was he was always had about you know a good half dozen bike lengths. Finales didn't really have an answer for him in, in the latter stages of the race and. Yeah, Dovi was always in control, and it was tense because again, he, there were always like a, like you know four or five temps behind, and you know a little, you know we were always wondering if, if Maverick had a little bit more, whether he was going to go for the win or whether he was thinking championship. Turns out he was thinking championship in the end, but yeah, like we've never seen Dovi quite that assured at the front, and it was an incredibly measured performance from Andrea, who again we we, we don't give him enough due. The man is a complete workhorse, and. You know, this is this is one of the tracks where, if everything went to plan, he he, he would get there, and he, he did. And again, he, he made it look very easy out there, which is something I've never said about the Vizioso before. He's 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 quite the rider, and um, yeah, everything just came together beautifully on this one. That GP17 was was very very fast around here. Mm, yeah, we, we we have to talk about about the Vizioso Bex and, and give him his due. I mean, he, we we shouldn't forget that on the Sunday morning, the story surrounding Andre Vizioso was that he'd been up all night with the trots uh, and Mugello. He was pretty badly ill, 
uh, on the Saturday night. He's suffering from food poisoning, something that uh, his former teammate Andrea Inoni suffered from uh, in the build-up to the weekend. So there was obviously a bit of it around in Mugello last weekend. Um, so Davizio so wasn't exactly at 100% peak physical condition going into the race either. Um, but as Dre said, he's he's a real workhorse. He's put the hard yards in with Ducati over the years. He's, he's suffered when this bike hasn't necessarily been competitive enough to challenge for victories um, in Grand Prix. Um, and for him to do it at home, to, to win a Grand Prix, win his first ever dry Grand Prix in MotoGP at somewhere like Mugello, the, the jewel in the crown in MotoGP, um, is such a deserved reward for the guy. And you know, many, many other guys, when someone like Jorge Lorenzo joins the team as the clearly the chosen one by by Bologna the, the big money signing not many other riders would have taken that with um the kind of reaction that Davizioso has Davizioso really he's really stood up in that team hasn't he and he's he can't really be argued that he's not the team leader right now oh no because he's certainly the only one in that Ducati factory producing anything of worth at the moment and you know Dobby's always been one of those guys that has I've said it I think I said it countless times last season he kind of just runs his own race and he goes under the radar so much. But as you say, he stepped up to the plate this year and that probably was the kick up the arse that he needed with Ducati signing Lorenzo because he could have quite easily been kicked to the curb. Um, I mean, I spoke volumes at the, you know, when, when Ducati made the announcement last year. Oh, I think we all did. As to which rider they were keeping. And I would hold my hands up and admit, they. but I said Ducati called it wrong. They got rid of the wrong rider because Javi wasn't going anywhere. Ian and I had so much more to look forward to. He seemed humble. He seemed more passionate. He looked like the guy that was next going to, you know, take the next step for Ducati. And I'm, I, I'm not going to say that I've been proved wrong because I think, you know, they still could have done that for Ducati. Um, but Davizioso really has sort of stepped up to the plate and gone, no, no, you're not kicking me to the curb that easy. You're not going to just wash me out. I am here and I'm, I am going to be the number one rider and I'm going to prove to them that, you know, you don't need to make the big money signings because if you stick to homegrown talent, they can get you the results that they want as well. And he really did prove that at the weekend, at his home weekend. And I mean, I'll be honest, you know, I saw the results and, and I had to, you know, I just double looked and was like, okay, oh, crikey, okay. That one was, I, I'll be honest, I didn't didn't expect. I, I it must have rained. Guys last week. <laughs> I, I listened to you guys last week and I was like, no. Nah. There's no way he's going to do it. Um, so, fair play to him. He's either just had a, an incredible, incredible weekend and I've not, I didn't see much of the race weekend, or he sold his soul, his life, and the secret colour to that beautiful red livery to the devil to get that win. But what an incredible win it was, and you cannot take nothing away from him. Yeah. That was an extremely roundabout way of saying you were wrong, Bex. That's a... <laughs> <laughs> Those words never came out of my mouth. Well, I, I, to yeah. be fair, I, I do agree with Bex in that you know they may well have been able to do this as well, but there is no question that Davizioso has has gone on to pay his team back for, for sticking with him. I mean, many, many teams mm -hmm. might not have done that. May, many teams may have gone with the talent of Yanone and the, perhaps the unrealized talent of Yanone rather than the, the known quantity that Davizioso um, appeared to provide Dre, but... As much as we thought he was a known quantity going into the season, perhaps I don't think even we knew he had this kind of level in him, did we? Well, he won a race last year. He was a, he was a solid in the championship. Ducati was still kind of rebuilding themselves in 2016. And, you know, it was a down year for Rian only despite his first top flight win. Um, I, I said it at the, at the end of the last season, I felt like... Ducati were in a lose-lose situation here. They were going to have to say goodbye to one very good rider either way. Um, you know, it's, it's true. Like you're absolutely right. In, in in an era of motorsport where we like them young and exciting, and we like new talent to get the to get the gigs. I mean, God, we, 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 a lot of people have been wanting to get rid of Pedrosa for years for that very reason, even though he's still a solid rider. Um, yeah, I can see why people would say, you know, let's keep Iannone. He's a bit more excited. He might have a little bit more upside than Dovi does at this point. But we forget Dovi starts these seasons very strong. He was a couple of years ago. He started the season with three second places and was second overall by the time he got to Catalonia. He's a good starter, Dovi. He likes the first half of the calendar. And yeah, like you're absolutely right in the sense that I would never expect Dovi to be this good. This early on, and again, he's, he seems to just been very quiet this season. Like, I mean, 
Lorenzo stole some headlines when he finished third at Haref. Obviously, Vinales has, has captivated MotoGP probably the most out of anybody this year in his fight with Rossi. You know, Marquez has been up and down, as has Pedrosa. And Dovi very quietly, once again, has put in the worksman shift. He's, 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 he's put in the, the maximum, really, that he can get out of a bike. He's not a fan of Haref, but he's still pulled out a solid result. And yeah, it, it's proven that in a, in a field right now where everyone's made at least one killer mistake, Dovi really hasn't done that so far this season outside of being taken out in Argentina. So when you weigh it all up, I'm not totally surprised he's second overall right now, but he's always had that level of upside, Dovi. He's always been a consistent player. So and in a field like this right now, consistency is paying off. What does this tell us about Ducati then? I mean, it's this season is proving so unpredictable, almost as unpredictable as last year was, uh, to be honest. But Ducati were, were so competitive there. Of course, they filled two of the three podium spots, and one of the other Ducatis in the field <laughs> led the race. Uh, I remembered after f- um, first practice, um, on on the um, Friday morning, Davizioso and Pirro were one and two as well. Um, and Cal Crutchlow, in one of his many rants of the weekend, we'll get to another of them awesome. later. Um, he also pointed to the tyres that Michelin had brought to the Grand Prix. Um, they changed the focus on a front tyre construction. It was a stiffer specification, um, but a softer overall tyre. Um, and Cal Crutchlow <laughs> said that, as far as the Hondas were concerned, it was pointless to even turn up um, because he says oh, wow. the, the, the hardest of the soft tyre, the hardest of the tyres, was too soft for Pedrosa to run. Um, basically, and we know the Hondas like to run the harder front tyre. Um, and Crutchlow's quotes after the race were, I believe that Michelin built the tyre for Ducati this weekend. It was always going to be difficult to beat the Ducatis here with the tyre allocation. Um, so did Ducati kind of fall into a situation, Dre, where basically all of the cards fell in a line for them and everything suited them? Um, and perhaps come Catalina this weekend, we may go back to the Ducati we're more used to seeing this year. Maybe. Maybe. Um... I think the only conclusive thing I can draw for Michelin and the tyres and where they when where and where they're playing out on these bikes is nothing is certain mm. right now. And um, yeah, I would never have guessed that Ducati would have been this good going into the weekend. I don't think anybody. I mean, again, Cal was was you know sur- I think surprised himself that Honda you know was so far off the pace and yeah, like. <sighs> It's great that it's unpredictable. I'm not denying that for a minute, but of course it's going to tick a rider off when mm. you know it's when you know that the tire allocation is so unpredictable. In any given weekend, you could either be great or terrible depending on how these tires react to this track. And it reminds me a lot of the Formula One 2013 season where Pirelli were, were in were right in the middle of that tug of war between what the FIA wanted, which was you know a fast degrading you know, a tire that hit the cliff really quickly and, you know, a, a performance drop off to open the door for more passing and the team's not liking it because they'd have to run more pit stops. I remember that year, Spain was a four stop race. It was bonkers. Um, and it's, I remember that Lotus and Ferrari were really strong at the start of the season. And then when they changed the tires around and they changed the structure, Red Bull and Mercedes were a lot happier and the Ferrari were pissed off. It's it's mm. it, like they couldn't win on, on, on those situations. And I think Misha are in the same sort of lose, lose here where they're going to tick somebody off because we saw it in her F Yamaha struggled. We saw it here. Honda struggled. Ducati have not really had a, a, a weekend of that level of upside since Qatar. So it's been a little bit all over the place so far this season. I don't think there's any straight up obvious like number one bike and tire combination right now. And this new structure, this new 70 um, layout front tire, which is supposedly harder and more asymmetric, it split the paddock up again. Like people like Vinales and hate it, but other guys like Dovi love it. So you you know, Marquez is is a fan of it too. So it's just a little bit all over the place right now. It's, uh, not ideal to say the least, but hey, as, as, as fans, it makes it more visible, and that's not a bad thing. No, not a bad thing at all. The Vizioso, then the race winner, that was his third career victory in MotoGP. Um, as I say, his first in a race with no weather in it to um, to kind of mix things up. Uh, Donington Park back in 2009, and then Sepang last year were his two other uh, MotoGP victories. Um, Maverick Vinales second then in the championship and Bex, it's been an unpredictable season all told so far, but Vinales is now 26 points clear uh, of Davizioso who's gone from 6th to 2nd in the World Championship with his win uh, of the weekend, so whilst so much unpredictability dominates MotoGP at the moment, Vinales is doing the sensible thing, isn't he? Banking the points, banking the podiums. Yeah, it's kind of getting to the point now where I'm regretting being so confident he would get scared and kind of throw the championship lead away uh, because I'm going to have to buy 
a lot of drinks for a lot of customers um, if this little so-and-so carries on with the performance he's doing because I was that confident that that even though I know how good he was at the start of the season, I was that confident that he'd get on the Yamaha and he'd go really well for the first few races and then he'd sort of like lose his head a little bit because it'd just be so different and so, you know, obscure for him being in that position and there was going to be so much more media attention and I didn't know how he was going to be able to cope with that. And so I was confident that he weren't going to be champion at the end of this year. Jesus Christ. How wrong am I going to be come November? Because again, oh, then it, that, <laughs> they are not going to let me live this down. There are so many customers that come into my club and talk to me about the MotoGP, and I don't think I can face any one of them if he wins it because I was so confident at the start of this year that it was not going to happen. And they're all in Dreamland. I called a lot of them cuckoo and said. If Rossi don't win it, uh, then it's Marquez's name written all over it, and they were like, "No." So, no. what was your reasoning for writing off Marquez, like, like writing off Vinales so quickly? I, no, I just like I just said, like I just thought that the pressure would, would get to him too much because we we saw how good he was at Suzuki, but it's a completely different kettle of fish being on arguably the best bike in the in the paddock uh, in in the paddock with arguably the best teammate you could ever wish to have. Um, and there's just so much to live up to. And, you know, we all know that Roxy's not going to be around forever. And, you know, the media were pinning all all of Yamaha's hopes on Vinales, saying that he's going to be, he needs to be the guy to step up to the plate, to take over from Rossi, to continue Yamaha's Especially how um, success. And, yeah... And I thought that just the way the media were portraying the way he sees and needed to go, that he'd bottle it because I thought that there was going to be too much pressure on him. I mean, it's, it's what's interesting is that Maverick Vinales spent a lot of the winter analysing Mark Marquez's lap charts from last year, didn't he? He he was looking at that and looking at his consistency and thinking, how can I mirror that in Grand Prix this year? But it seems that another thing, Dre, that Vinales is trying to mirror in Mark Marquez is his consistency of podiums. Of course, he had that crash at uh, the Circuit of the Americas, which is the sort of blot on his copybook. But it, it did appear to me that once he got the better of Petrucci um, in that battle for second, he could have maybe had a go at chasing Dovizioso down, but he clearly made the decision that 20 points were doing fine especially with Valentino two spots back in fourth um, Marquez you know, two further back Marquez two further back I mean being basically being plus seven on Valentino he will take that every day of the week and yeah like like the risk reward level payoff probably just wasn't there and for, for in the others and like in, in the response to Bex's earlier concerns, this is a man that has shined at every level of Grand Prix motorcycle racing and every challenge he's ever faced. He is. I he is. No, I did not doubt that. I, I I said we know how good he was at Suzuki, but it is such a different kettle of fish. Being stuck is so much more in the limelight. Can I just say I really admire the hole you're digging yourself into here. I think it's great. And, um, it's, 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 you're just giving me that much more ammunition for November. It's going to be fantastic when the season's over. But um, the way it's going right now, I mean, that was, again, a very intelligent ride from Vinales, given the circumstances. He knew that Rossi was two spots back. He knew Mark. He probably knew Marquez was, was not in that lead battle. And, you know, he was struggling with Bautista. In, in, in that race and you know the extra five points was it worth potentially falling off your bike for no not when he's plus seven on Valentino not when he's do the math here Dre uh, 13 11 10 it's a plus 10 on Marquez as well um yeah that's that that's a good weekend for, for Maverick under any measure and it was a bit like a ref where he finished in sixth place that race and it was like well listen Rossi's in 10th you know, we, we threw some points away to the Hondas, but they were further back. So that's a, that's an acceptable, you know, acceptable loss. Then, yeah, you know, if Maverick's just not making these mistakes, I think he has got the outright pace advantage over Valentino, injured or not, um, the way this season's played out so far. And that is important. If, if Maverick doesn't fall and doesn't make silly mistakes, then he's going to beat Valentino in this championship for me. Like, the next, I'm, the next I'm, two I'm, races I'm, are going to tell us all, aren't they? Catalonia, where, where Rossi so. won last year, um, his last win, of course. It's now a year, a year one-year anniversary from his last Grand Prix win. Um, and then Assen, where Rossi so often goes well and probably should have won last year. 
um, had he mm-hmm. not binned it from the lead. Um, so so you've got to feel that. I mean, Mario Vinales, and this is in no way a criticism of him um, because he's done a fantastic job in the championship, but I'm kind of relieved, Dre. I don't know about you. I'm kind of relieved. He doesn't seem to have that air of unbeatable, um, that unbeatable air around him that we thought he might have in pre-season. Um, he's not going off and dominating races like perhaps we feared he would. Um, but he's still 26 points clear. So that's in no way a criticism. He's doing the sensible thing and leading the championship. Um, but it does seem as if Maverick's not necessarily going to run away with this championship, but they certainly can't let that gap grow too much bigger uh, than it is. It's 26 points at the moment, so that's just about manageable um, with two-thirds of the season to go. But they cannot allow Maverick to get that to sort of th- into the 30s and 40s of points advantage because that's when he's got the points lead in a position where he can manage it as Marquez did so well uh, last season where he can settle for seconds um Mark Vinales will still be in the mindset at the moment where he'll be going into every race trying to win it if at all possible and then he'll assess it as the race goes on um so Barcelona is gonna be very interesting this weekend a race or a circuit that Vinales enjoys of course this is Maverick's home territory now um this weekend um and having beaten Rossi on track on Rossi's home tour. Rossi will no doubt be looking to return the favour um, this weekend, but of course they'll have a lot more competition up against them this weekend, and we'll preview uh, Monmelo a little bit later on uh, in the show. Uh, on to the guy that finished third then, uh, Daniel Petrucci, um, who came from ninth on the grid to finish on the podium, proving that it's not just Jonathan Ray who can do that these days. Um, <laughs> but, um, but but what a ride and what a weekend from him, because we, we shouldn't forget that he set the second fastest time in qualifying, but then had it deleted for track limits, um, which drops him all the way to ninth on the grid. <laughs> and he legitimately had the pace to run with the front guys. And... Um, <sighs> Very similar to Davizioso, I suppose, in that so often we see the best of Davizioso in the wet. We haven't seen this level of performance from Petrucci in the dry, have we? No, never. Uh, not like again. He's always been a wet weather guy, Petrucci, and you know, his, his level of confidence and brass balls are almost unmatched in the in the wet in MotoGP. But uh, in the dry, we, we, we've never seen him on this sort of level. It, it's clear that Ducati must have had a really good setup on the GP17. But this round, the heck, the 16 was strong as well, finishing in fifth with Bautista. So, Ducati just seemed to have a good package overall this weekend. But saying it what you will, like this, that that third was not a fluke on the weekend. But Trucci was fast all the way through, and in qualifying, as you said, would have qualified on the front row if it wasn't for a, a marginal track limits call. And yeah, like like that was no fluke. He and again the way he, there was no attrition, there was no major disaster up the front further on. He earned it. That was totally on pace. That was totally on merit and ability alone. He owned it. It was a it was a tremendous, probably the best performance in Nino Petrucci's career. I would probably take that over Silverstone a couple of years ago because he's that never done that. In the dry. Assisted exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and he's never done that in the dry before, and that was just an outstanding performance. The fact that he had, he had the confidence to overtake and play with Valentino Rossi and Mark Marquez, and he looked like he belonged up there. That was the best a Pramac has probably looked on a race track since Andre Iannone was riding it a couple of years ago. That was a real punching above your weight performance. And um, yeah, tremendous stuff. He's one of the rides of the season so far for me. Absolutely. And he was, you know, he had a lot of work to do earlier in the race because he got the better of Marquez early on. And then he had to try and, there was a bit of a gap. The top three had broken away. Um, of, of Davizioso and the two Yamahas, and Petrucci did brilliantly to jump across that gap. I mean, Mugello, um, as the Moto3 race demonstrated, is, is such a hard circuit to be gapped on, but when you are gapped, it's so difficult to jump across it and get back on the front <laughs> again. Um, so for, for Petrucci to do that was incredible, and he legitimately had the pace to go with the front, and once he got to second, he got ahead of Vinales at one point, he kind of thought, yeah, I might as well settle for this, because as soon as Vinales came back past him, he kind of realised, hey, I'm on a podium position here, and Valentino's fading with his, his physical issues, so... Um, I might as well make sure I make, get this bike on the podium rather than trip on the street um, trying to did go you, for a did, win. Did you see their there. press conference? After, did you see their press release after the race? No. Uh, oh, it's 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 quality. Um, for those that didn't see it, um, Framac obviously a lot of the teams give out press releases after the Grand Prix, you know, summing up their 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 riders' weekend. And Pramac had a very creative press release this week. I know if you go, look it up on the internet if you get a chance and you're listening to this, but all it was was it was a picture. In, in big red capital letters, Danilo Petrucci got on the podium for Pramac MotoGP. Dot, dot, dot. That is all. And that was it. <laughs> Press release. Yeah, like, that speaks right. for itself. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's but, uh, it. Like, it, was, it was hilarious when I read it. it was, it's, it's quality. <laughs> but we, we, have, we have to say, Bex, as well, I mean, I mean Petrucci 
I think everyone here has got a soft spot for Drew G. He's such a likable guy. Um, he's got such a, a just a personality that you can't help but warm to. He's such a funny guy. He's he speaks with such warmth whenever you hear him in press conferences. He's a guy that you just you can't help but like. Um, but no question, there was pressure on him this year because he earned the right to have the GP17. Um, I dare say Bex wishes that his teammate got it. Um, Scott Redding last year, um, but. This is the kind of performance that justifies that faith in him, doesn't it? Yeah, um, you're, you're, you're not wrong. So I, I did want to get ready to get the GP17. Um, shut up, Drake. I still got the podium rod. That, 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 that's, that, that's a hat trick. Uh, that's, what, that's what I'm going to say. It's a hat trick of just like Rebecca's just like going back through time and undoing all these mistakes she made in predictions this season. Do we need to talk about when Scott Redding got on the podium and you said that was never going to happen in a month of Sundays? Listen, you can do if you want. Listen, if you want to start reliving history, hey, Dre, hey, Dre, Dre, Dre's going to be his flag cap on the next episode of Motorsport 101 on episode 90. So, listen, listen. I'm pretty sure he said he was going to do that when Scott Reddy met the podium as well. Listen, listen. If Bex is happy with <laughs> one out of ten on her exam, then more power to her. Like, you know. <laughs> oh, I hear excuses. Anyway. Daniel Patrick. As I was saying, yes. I did want Scott Redding to get the, the, the GP17. Didn't argue when he didn't because, quite frankly, he did performances in to get it. Um, I thought it was a very difficult decision and very... for, for, for anyone to make between two riders. Um, but a performance at a Mugello, like Daniel Lepaducci put in last weekend, has got to make everyone stand up and realise, actually... They were right to give him the, the, the current up-to-date, fully specced bike. Um, and it was an incredible, incredible race. And one that I didn't, again, looked at it and kind of went, okay, right, yep, yeah, hang on for a minute, what? Say what? That was that, that was not my reaction. Well, I think um, we were all watching the race, waiting for him to be dropped, waiting for him to drop off the leading group, and it never happened. Yeah. And it was just, you know, it was a brilliant reward for a long time coming shall we say. And because I think you hit the nail on the head, on the head there, Lewis, he's a nice guy. You can't help but smile whenever you listen to his interviews um, or, or, or laugh along with him. He's just got that sort of calming voice that fills you with, you know, joy when you yeah. watch him and you smile and he just he seems so likeable and lovable. He's got time for everyone. And so I'm really glad that he managed to get on the podium mm, because yeah, he, he so... might have stolen my, my man's bike, but... <laughs> He's a nice person, so I'll let you know. He, he never had his name on that bike. He never did. He, like, he was always he, second rate to Petrucci. He had a finger on it, sure. <laughs> it does seem an awful long time ago that he was on that piss poor Iota, though, isn't it, Dre? It just, it's again, oh, it's, 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 just, it's, another, it's another of the hard workers of MotoGP who, who got his reward at the weekend because, of course, Petrucci was on the worst bike in the field uh, when he first came into, into this class. Um, um, but Bex, on a more general point, it's. I think we have to doff our caps to Dorna here, don't we? In the in the the, the, the playing field that they've created now in MotoGP, um, where if you think back to a two or three years ago when we first started doing this show, we, we were having some great MotoGP racing with the brilliance of Marquez. We had the championship battle between Rossi and Lorenzo that went down to the wire. But even then, on any given weekend, when a weekend started, we were going into it thinking that the race winner is going to come from one of four guys. It's going to be either one of the two factory Yamahas or one of the two factory Hondas. Um, and... In the last three races, we've seen Jerez dominated by Hondas, Le Mans dominated by Yamahas, uh, and now we've seen Ducatis come to the front at Mugello, and satellite bikes up there as well. Petrucci on the podium, Zarco on the podium, Crutchlow probably would have been on the podium had he not binned it in Jerez. And we're now going into MotoGP races, and this is kind of the testament, Bex, to how well Dorna have done. We are now going into MotoGP weekend, starting with Bar Barcelona this weekend, where we legitimately do not have a clue what to expect, and we cannot narrow the field of potential winners to four riders anymore. In fairness, bar me, your pair predictions have always been pretty off anyway. Um, Excuse but... me? <laughs> <laughs> I won the Predictions League, oh, not so last year, me. the year before. So... She's still and I won it by a country mile as well. I'm, I'm so nice, you... nice, nice to see that reputation yeah. carried you forward in the long run. So how about a Twitter bio next? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that, that, that's two marks on my exam, Dre, not just one. Just one up, you know, putting that you're still, you're still like free, You're still like free off a passing grade. Keep going. <laughs> I'll get there by the end of the show, don't you worry. I always find a way. <laughs> anyway, um, as, as I was saying, yeah, 
Emoji P has always been the elite of the elite, but they just Madonna have managed to turn it around to the point where it's so close, and you're on the edge of your seat from the start as the moment the lights go out, and that's that's not even talking about the the, the amount of guys that go through quali and they're setting hot lap after hot lap, and you you really don't really know who's gonna get themselves on pole either. I don't think I've called a pole position right at all yeah. this season. I'll be a hundred percent honest. I don't think I've called one road at all, mainly because I just keep back in the same rider. But yeah. that's that's head over heart yeah, or heart over head, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, Sam Lowe's ain't going to get pulled that pretty back. I'm sorry. Yeah. One day, one day, mark my words. <laughs> okay. I don't quite know what that when that, that day will be. But no, no I, I, I adamantly will say that Sam Lowe's will never have a MotoGP pole position, and if you do, I'll buy you his merchandise. <laughs> I will not say no. I did get excited the other day when I saw your um your new helmet with 22 on the top and was like, I've turned yeah, him, and then realized it was a Jensen Button one. <laughs> I got really upset. Yeah, yeah, give me a fat freaking chance of that one. I'm like, what are you dreaming? <laughs> um, but no, the field is so close this year. It's absolutely incredible, and Dorna should be so impressed with themselves that they've managed to create a field like this that is never going to be touched. And I don't care what they say. I am biased because I am not, not the biggest fan of full motorsport. I will sit and enjoy it, but if I had the choice, bikes win 100% every time with me. I don't think there is any other motorsport on this planet that can come close to the thrill and the action and the enjoyment that you get in MotoGP this season. Prove me wrong, I challenge you. Well, you, well, you think back to a few years ago, Dre, when the grid numbers were so low and we had CRT bikes on the grid and there was a lot of political wrangling going on because Honda was so uh, anti rule changes to dumb down electronics and such like and which is what we eventually got what don eventually getting their way and and the and the commission got their way on this one the fim um and this was the kind of situation the kind of playing field they were trying to work their way towards wasn't it with Donna? um it was, yeah. this was their this was their their vision for, for MotoGP in the future and it's almost like we're having our sort of f1 2012 kind of era at the moment in, in MotoGP gp where we now go into weekend. We've now, as I say, we've now seen in this season, in the first six races, we've seen Yamaha, Honda, and Ducati all win races on pure pace. And yeah. and the satellite teams have a chance now. We we go to Grand Prix now, and Tech Three, LCR, Pramac, Aspar, Mark VDS, all know if they go to a Grand Prix weekend and get it right and they nail it, they can get their rewards now. Yeah, they can finish on the podium. We've already had two independent riders on the podium so far this season. Who's Zarco and now Petrucci? And as you say, we've had four we've had four different winners in the first six races this season, and Valentino Rossi is not one of them. Neither is Jorge Lorenzo. And neither is Jorge Lorenzo, and you're talking about two of the best riders in history right there. Um so yeah, you're absolutely right. This is this is the dream that Dorna always wanted. And again, as you say, I think Honda were the ones that were holding that back. And ironically, they're the ones that are probably struggling the most now in this era, which is amazing given they have a once-in-a-generation sort of talent with Marquez right there. But yeah, you're absolutely right. This is the dream. Like This, is just, this was always Dorna's dream to have a more competitive field. We saw the plans a couple of years ago come out on this show where we're like, okay, they're going to try and get 25 blacks on the field they're going to, and they're going to subsidize the satellites to, you know, give the smaller teams a chance to be able to compete, be competitive, score more points, you know, win more prize money. And yeah, you're absolutely right. It's working beautifully right now with, again, like as you said, the big three factories have all won races on merit so far this season. The satellites have been incredibly impressive. Jonas Folger, Johan Zarco, Danilo Petrucci. Um, they've all had like outstanding moments so far this season. Even Alex Rins was was very strong in Qatar before he got hurt. Um, so yeah, and that in that race, even Suzuki was up there. He only was running with the leaders until he he hit Marquez's rear tire. So we've had all sorts of competition balance so far this season, and it's been fantastic to see. And as you said, as a result now. We are going into race weekends having absolutely no idea who's going to win. And that is something that in MotoGP was unthinkable even five years ago, where it was simply it's going to be one of these four dudes on these two big factory bikes. Even two years ago, it was going to be a case of anyone on a Honda or a Yamaha. And that was about it, really. And now we've got a situation where going into going into Magello a 16 to 1 shot won a Grand Prix that never happens in MotoGP like so 
so for that for that to be to that to happen, it's 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 tremendous, and it's it's only more captivating for the sport in the long run. Absolutely, it's it, it's looking so so good. Um, Dre talks about uh, the dream of Dorna and um, where we want to get towards. Well, the dream of ninety eight thousand uh, who packed themselves into Mugello on Sunday was for a Valentino Rossi victory, um, and we we talked about it earlier on the atmosphere when Rossi took the lead early on. Um, uh, and that battle between himself and Lorenzo in the early laps was was fantastic sporting theatre to watch. It was brilliant. Um, but he didn't quite get the result he was after in the end, Dre. He finished fourth, um, pointing to the fact that he said physically he was finished with eight to go. Uh, and it kind of looked it, didn't it? He did. Um, I'm not going to fall into my own Rossi paradox here. This was a solid performance, all things considered. And if it's true that he was physically shot with eight to go, then that was a decent recovery job from Rossi to finish. Not too far out of what the form was was kind of expecting um, in fourth place. It, it was a it was a decent job. And yeah, this was that guy could not have been easy. Again, we talked about it last week. That injury sounded gruesome. It sounded brutal to, have, to have, for Rossi to have an accident like that and then having to race basically five days later and I don't, I don't think he'll still be 100% now racing in no, Catalonia he, he said today that he still needs another week before he's fully fit yeah so, so again, he, kinda, he's he was kind of hoping that Barcelona wasn't back to back yeah so yeah he's, he's going to be riding her at least for another week or so most likely Aston will be when he's back to full fitness but yeah as you say I mean this like this this wasn't a bad job at all given the circumstances I mean again when you want to win a championship, you win it on your worst days, not your best. And that was a solid fourth place. And it's a shame because he, he still lost seven points to Maverick Vinales, who probably is the biggest threat for the title, which is a shame. But in the grand scheme, it could have easily been a lot worse. So he could have very easily not ridden this weekend. So, you know, you, you've got to take these points where you can get them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was. I mean, obviously, this was the Grand Prix he dearly wanted to win. Um, but uh, in the end, it just wasn't going to happen. So get out with, uh, with some points and move on. Um, we can't talk about Valentino Rossi and Mugello without talking about his uh, his custom helmet for the weekend. And uh, of course, he gave a nod to Francesco Totti, the retiring Italian footballer, yes. uh, this week. And also the, um, the very classy amalgamation of the 46 and the 69. Uh, on the side of his helmet in tribute to, to the late Nicky Hayden as well um, from Valentino Rossi um, last weekend. Um, but, yeah, Bex, given his physical situation, um, and uh, we know motocross injuries are a, a favourite topic of yours, um, <laughs> 13 points wasn't the worst return in the world, was it? Uh, no, you're right. It could have been a hell of a lot worse. But I don't want to open this kind of worms <laughs> again. Um, as to um, it annoys the living hell out of me. It aggravates me so much that I just literally want to grab hold of them and shake them and go, mate, you, you've you got a very expensive contract in your in your filing cabinet at the home. Most expensive you in are, sport. <laughs> you are, exactly, you are worth millions. You have got thousands upon thousands, nearly hundreds of thousands of fans with their backside on a seat to watch you race, and you put that all in jeopardy for what? For fun? For fitness? Because I'm pretty sure there are gyms you can go to, there's a road bike you can go, uh, like a race, a mountain bike that you can use, you can go running. Why? (laughs) Why do you need, before the biggest Grand Prix, do you you have to... You seem quite pressed about this, Bex. Like, seriously, like, you you seem heated. Yeah, because... (laughs) Now, this because this is not just aimed at Valentino Rossi. This is also aimed at Thomas Golov, who on the morning, right? So it wasn't even a few days before a race, the speedway meeting. So be the morning fun. of a speedway meeting in Poland, Thomas Golov decides to go on a motocross bike, have a few skids, go over a few jumps, falls off, does something to his back. And he's virtually paralysed himself. Thankfully, he's starting to get the feeling back in his legs. But he has let everyone in his in his Polish team down. And I know I've got a bit of a side tangent, but he's not just Valentina Rossi that I'm pissed at either at the moment. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, oh, oh really? Yeah. A bit of a side yes. <laughs> let, let his Polish team down. Let the fans down. Let his sponsors down. Let absolutely everyone down. The morning of a Grand Prix... Uh, it wasn't a Grand Prix. The morning of a race meeting for me. And I know Thomas Scott is coming to the end of his speedway career. And I fully understand that. But if you are not physically so fit on the morning of the meeting you're meant to be racing in, then why are you racing it this season in the first place? If you feel the need to warm up, you have to go racing in a motor 
cross race in the morning if three, four, five hours before your speedway meeting, which is physically draining for even the fittest of people, then you need to question what is going wrong with your fitness regime. And it's the thing it's just it just annoys the living hell out of me that even during the season they make these decisions, they get on a motocross bike, it ends in tears, and then they it, it just, just well, if it was why well, I think no, I think we're fairly confident. No sympathy. I think we're fairly confident that if Bex was running her own MotoGP team, she'd be saying to Sam and Alex Lowe's, because let's face it, those would be the two riders. Um, she'd she'd have it written into the contract that you cannot ride a mo- motocross riding. bike during no. the season. Um, but Valentino no. Valentino Rossi did that, um, and he um, yeah he said after the the, the Grand Prix that he said he'd be basically in free practice. Of course, he'd been doing one runs, but he'd never really been doing more than eight or nine laps in a row um, during free practice. So it was a it was a whole new kettle of fish to do twenty three in a row. Uh, in the Grand Prix on the Sunday, um, which is what he had to do. And uh, as he said to MBCM, with eight laps to go, he was already finished. And uh, as I say, it kind of looked it because it was kind of like Le Mans where we were waiting for the late Valentino Rossi charge through the field as we got in Le Mans when he then t- took on Vinales. And it never happened. Uh, Mugello, as he just sort of slowly faded into the background uh, of that leading group. Um, Valentino Rossi then finishing fourth, which for the championship, not quite what he was after. This was kind of one of the weekend's pre-injury that he'd been looking at to really gain points rather than lose them um, in the overall championship fight. Um, fifth position went to a rider that we, we have to mention. He's going to be mentioned in passing, unfortunately, but, Dre, we have to sing the praises of Alvaro Bautista. Um, it wasn't just the factory GP17 Ducatis that were competitive at Mugello. Bautista on the old bike taking fifth ahead of the world champion. Yeah, and just and just 5.8 seconds off the win. Um great great job as uh, as bex has gone off to uh vent her anger in the toilet um <laughs> <laughs> but, that, uh, Andre. you're very welcome uh it's only fair after all the all the shade you thrown at me earlier in the show um as i was saying yeah but Bautista, that was a very very strong performance again the gp16 very fast round here too and again very quietly Bautista's putting together quite the season and yeah, he's doing a very, very good job, and you know he held off the reigning world champion behind him in Mark Marquez, and you know that's that's no easy task by any stretch of the imagination on last year's GP16. So great, great ride from Alvaro Bautista. Mm, yeah, fifth for him, um, sixth then just behind him, uh, the world champion Mark Marquez. Um, now the Hondas at large all struggled, uh, at Mugello, Dre, and um, we've already heard Cal Crutchlow tell us why he thinks they struggled. He feels the tyre uh, allocation didn't suit the Hondas at all. Um, but since that Honda benefit that we saw at Jerez um, a month or so ago, we've now seen two Grand Prix where Honda weren't even close to competing for the front. Um, and we've still got two thirds of the season to go, um, still a long way to go, but in terms of competitiveness and in terms of the points he's got to make up, it's time to start worrying, isn't it, if you mark Marquez? Um, I said it on Twitter, I'll during the race, I said, I'm this close to calling Honda season a write-off. Um, and well, we're not, I'm not quite there yet, but we're close. Like, minus 37 and only maybe one really strong Honda round on paper left, and that's the Saxon ring coming up before the summer break. Um, Marquez is gonna have. To, it might have to go back to old Marquez and trying to trying to hit the home run on these races to catch up because which is when we see him crash. Exactly, and that's the problem because Marquez, you know, he knows where the line is. Sometimes he's got to step over it in order to win. And like, it's a shame because I'm, I'm glad that Marquez handled that with maturity. Because if he didn't, my God, like the, like Honda as a manufacturer would have probably just thrown away the entire manufacturer's championship if he had gone down. Um, but that I, I genuinely think that was the best that Honda could do at Mugello, and that that said a lot, really. That you know that Marquez was six seconds off the win on on a factory bike, and Honda just went nowhere all weekend long. Really, Pedrosa had, had a couple of fast practice times, but as the track got faster, they got left behind. Pedrosa really struggled out there, was falling down the order. Yeah, all we're we're going to talk about Pedrosa and Crutchlow in a moment, but their crash yeah. in the final lap was in a battle for eleventh. Yeah, like. Crutchlow and Pedrosa are capable normally of far, far better than that. And yeah, it it was just a struggle for Honda all the way through this weekend. At no point did he look comfortable out there. And this is coming off a weekend where Marcus said he liked the new front tyre, said it it gave him more confidence. And yet, despite that, nowhere to be seen and not, not relevant in this race, not relevant this weekend at all. And the lucky thing with him is that he's got a stronger round coming up in Catalonia, a race where he challenged for the win last year, and the slower track will help him out. But 
this is this this is this is like Cody Yellow for, for for Honda right here. They need Marquez to win a couple more before the break to realistically have any sort of chance because look, I would not want to be chasing now Maverick Vinales on a minus thirty seven handicap. That's not pretty. No, and um, yeah, I've asked Dre this a moment ago, Beck. So, so I'll ask you too. In terms of Mark Marquez's championship hopes and the defense of his title, I mean, if you had a bet on Mark Marquez at the start of the season, would you be feeling me quite worried right now? Um. Yes, um, and I am quite worried. Do I think he can turn it round? I think he's the only rider good enough that can turn around a deficit like that. Um, but no, I am worried, and I did back Marcus to win the championship again this year. I'll, I'll hold my hands up and admit that I I was that person. Um, and I, I did say earlier on it's going to cost me a lot of money if that's pesky. Pesky no, news. We, we know he didn't back Maverick. No, <laughs> that. how's that going for you? Um, not too well. It's a bitter pill to swallow at the moment. I have to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, as you know, I do believe that if there is any one person in that paddock at the moment that can turn around a deficit as vast as that, then it is Mark Marquez. And so, ask me about September time whether I'm worried, and I'll give you a straight answer. But at the moment. Yes, I'm worried, but I think he can turn it around. Mm, yeah, I mean, it's that's the thing. We're, we're talking about it at the moment as if it's it's Mark that's going to turn it around rather than Honda. I mean, Honda were quite comfortably the third fastest manufacturer uh, at Mugello the weekend. And again, that might be part of that might be down to Mugello. You know, Barcelona might be different this weekend. It might not favour the Ducatis quite as much. Um, but you've got to wonder at the moment, I know he's the Reading World Champion, so there's no reason why he'd be starting to uh, lose patience with Honda in the same way that their Formula 1 counterparts are at the moment. Um, but <laughs> but, how, but how much longer will this last? Say Mark Marquez is in this kind of situation next year, Dre, and that Honda are falling over themselves, trying to keep pace with Yamaha and, at times, Ducati. How much longer will Mark Marquez keep patience with this? Because he's clearly a rider who, on pure pace, can win any given race when he feels like it. Yeah, this is a difficult one because Marquez has been incredibly loyal to that brand of Repsol Honda all the way through his Moto2 career, his Moto3 career, so when it was still 125s, and he was sponsored by Red Bull, and that's a, now the factory sponsor. But if he for, sees Maverick for... Vinales winning title after title... Yeah, then he, he's, he's going to want a piece of, you know, pastures new, so to speak, and, you know, that, that comes with its own set of questions, but, you I mean... Marquez has come through worse than this. Like we remember 2015. We remember when when we really did see Honda exposed um, in 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 this era of prototypes, where 2015 came along and Marquez was overriding the bike. He learned a very tough lesson that season. That listen, you're not going to win every race you set out to accomplish. Not not everything's going to be like 2014, where you can win 13 in a year. It's not like it's not that easy in MotoGP. It's, it's never that easy. And he learned his lesson last year when he learned consistency in order to win the title, and he did it beautifully to win that third to win that third MotoGP title. And yeah, it's. It's not an easy one because, as you say, like if if this frustration keeps up, because it's not Mark that's the problem. Mark has no. won often in spite of Honda, not because of Honda. And I don't know what's wrong with their entire motorsport division at this point, to be honest with you. But there's it's it's, no. it's one of those things where, where right now like he is pretty much the biggest name on the payroll right now, he's and carrying them. He's carrying them, and it's like. When I, I joked when Fernando Alonso's engine blew up at the Indy 500 a couple of weeks ago, I said I, I tweeted it's like, "Oh crap, it's all on Mar- Marquez again, or, or, or already." And it, 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 it's already starting to feel that way with, you know, McLaren Honda struggling and Fernando Alonso threatening to leave if McLaren don't win by September. And um, now, obviously, the yeah, Indy car struggles have not got along particularly well, despite Sato winning that. But it, it, in any case, yeah, it's it's. It's a weird case of apples and oranges right now, and Honda, you know, they're mo- like Honda's never looked comfortable this season outside of her ref, and to a lesser degree, Kota. But that's Marquez land anyway. So, yeah, like, and even then, it wasn't like a dominant Marquez victory until the second half of that race, where everybody else seemed to run out of gas. Honda looked like their third best right now, and that is terrifying, given that. Right now, Andrea De Vizioso is casually sitting there second in the championship because he may not have the upside that Marquez does, but he's certainly got 
the ability to, to pull in decent performances when they can. That sixth is very on Marquez like. Mm, yeah, Danny uh, Matt Marquez would have probably won Cota on Danny Kent's suitor. Um, yeah, he, he, he's, he's that good around there. Um, but uh, yeah, he, he, it's it's looking pretty grim for him at the moment. He's currently fifth in the world championship or fourth, fourth and fifth, the two Repsol Hondas, Marcus and Pajosa, they're both tied on 68 points um, with a win apiece. Um, 68 points from six rounds. So Marquez is essentially averaging 11 points around, which is fifth. <laughs> so he's not exactly um, lighting this up because he's had two crashes from the first six races, which haven't helped him uh, at all. Um, two of the other Hondas uh, crashed into each other on the final lap of the race. As we mentioned, they were fighting for 11th. Cal Crutchlow taken out by Danny Pedrosa. Um, now, I think we're all, we might as well get this out of the way now. I think we're all agreed that it was Danny's fault, the, the crash that we saw on the final lap. Danny yeah. basically went all it? Estoril 2006 uh, on Cal Crutchlow and basically went for a move that didn't work, lost the front and wiped out Crutchlow. Um but even if you've been taken out in the final lap of a race, Dre, um, surely you've got to react to it a little better than Cal Crutchlow did. Yeah, for the record, like it, it, it seemed like Cal was, I think he did a pretty decent job of winding it in until the last sentence to Hodgson, and he goes, I'm glad Danny Pedrosa's lost second in the championship. And it's just like, oh dear. I, I, I get Cal's frustration. It's the second straight round where Pedrosa's kind of had a negative influence on his race. We saw it at Le Mans as well where Pedrosa chopped him off and Cal was, you know, seemingly okay with it. He said, listen, I understand why. He didn't see me till the last minute. I get it. It's fine. So for it to happen again where Pedrosa has gone for a Hail Mary, got it completely wrong and taken Crutchlow out. Um, yeah, it's... Yeah, it's like, I get Cal's frustration. I genuinely do, because oh, that yeah, I think was, we all do. Yeah, like, I totally get it, but that was a very mean, nasty comment at the end of that, and it just seemed completely unnecessary you know, to, to take a personal shot at Danny Pedrosa like that, because he's taking you out. And don't get me wrong, I get where Cal's coming from. I, I'm firmly of the belief that sportsmanship is not an obligation. Um, it's a bonus. And again, we saw it in Moto2 where we saw um, Baldessari apologize to Nakagami after he yes. um, had a high side and, and take Nakagami out. But obviously, a, a very unfortunate accident. Um, but like, then it's not always going to be that simple. And again, like I said, I, I get Cal being angry. He's got every right not to accept his apology. He's got every right to be pissed. But you don't take it personal like that, and you don't insult the man like that because he made an he made an honest mistake. And you know that's bike racing. Cal Crutchlow is hardly perfect. We've seen him make numerous screw ups um, on bike, off bike, with other riders before in his career. And I don't see him bending over backwards apologising to people. But here we are. Like there's there's a level of double standard here with Crutchlow and. We all know he's got a reputation of just saying whatever he thinks and expecting people just to roll over and, and, and accept it. But unfortunately, that's not how this works. Pedrosa's got an incredibly passionate, dedicated fan base. And Pedrosa is one of the class acts of motorsport in general. And yeah. if Pedrosa uh, was, uh, uh, apologized, which he clearly did the moment he was off the bike, he was straight in there to apologize to Cal. And then Cal, Cal shoves him. Surprised Cal wasn't fined for that one, actually. Given mm, well, Cal, Cal did say after the race that if he'd been fined for it, he wouldn't have paid it because he because he wasn't <laughs> happy. He went all Colin McGregor. Um, but no, he said he wasn't happy that with Jack Miller's fine that he got um, in Barcelona when, he, of course, he clocked Alvaro Bautista after he'd been taken out of the Grand Prix. Um, there, I think it's it's one thing to be angry with someone for taking you out. I think we all accept that, but it's another to effectively take some sort of solace in another guy's disappointment and misfortune, um, which is what he's doing. Essentially, he's taking solace in the fact that Danny lost points and has basically his championship hopes have taken a serious dent, which um, is a dick move, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. There is no need for that um, from Cal Crutchlow's point of view. Um, neither of them score points, though, as I mentioned in the end. Pedrosa and Crutchlow both taken out of the final lap um, while they were fighting for 11th, which kind of um, illustrates how badly Honda's weekend went for them, all told. Um, Ducati's weekend bet though went well overall but perhaps one of the exceptions was Jorge Lorenzo who led the race early on um, had that exciting battle in the first few laps with Valentino Rossi and of course we still need to remember with Jorge Lorenzo that he's having to try and change a riding style of the last 10 years riding Yamahas to now riding Ducatis um, but no matter what kind of free passes we give Lorenzo it doesn't reflect too well on him when he goes from the lead down to 8th and his teammate wins the race yeah I mean <laughs> I ain't one to give Lorenzo that many free passes anyway. I think we've all been a bit for the past few seasons. So, I'm just going to tell you how it is. 
all hail Dobby, who at least saved your catties at a home mm. soil um, in what we would discuss as an incredible, incredible race. Um, and in my notes here, as the all singing, all dancing champion to be saviour, is being really useful right now. Mm. Um, because it just it infuriates me so much. Um, we can give. We can make so many excuses for Lorenzo, and in all honesty, he makes enough for himself anyway, so I don't know why we need to add our own <laughs> excuses in for him. Um, but to go from seventh and make a fantastic beat up to first and be like, yeah, leading the race, to then go crashing all the way back down to eighth while your teammate manages to secure a win. Um, 14 who seconds never on wins the road. Three, who never wins in the dry anyway. Um, and I mean, I mean, let's be honest. Lorenzo hates running in the wet. Dobby loves running in the wet. You'd think it'd be a great partnership, but you wouldn't expect Dobby to be the one that have won last weekend purely because of the conditions there. But Lorenzo has been one of those. Let's just say it's not been as smooth sailing for him making the transition over. And I think, if I'm completely honest, he thought that he was going to prove a point and say that he was going to be the one that come out the Ducati work making the switch and. You know, Casey struggled with the Ducati, but got it dialed and managed to win a champ. Um, you know, managed to win a, a fair bit. And you know, Rossi struggled so much. If Rossi can't make it work, then why on God's green earth did Jorge Lorenzo think he was going to be able to prove a point and, and make it work? Um, I do not know. That was but, almost part of the motivation, I think, for Lorenzo, wasn't it? It's almost do what Valentino Rossi couldn't um, for Ducati and turn them into winners. Um, but what made it even more sort of surprising and concerning, I suppose, if, if you're a Jorge Lorenzo fan, Dre, is that Mugello, historically, is one of Jorge's strongest tracks. He always goes well there. Um, he's, won there numerous, he's won there numerous times, as you say, in MotoGP in the past, and he was nearly beaten by Pirro on the, uh, on the lab bike, the test rider. Whoop, whoop, it's the sound of the police. Yes. Whoop, whoop. Um, yeah, as I was saying. As yeah, good as Piro is, um, as he shouldn't as be as beating Jorge Lorenzo on the same machinery, should he? Yeah, exactly. I, I love that Neil Hodgson interviewed him on the grid, and I was like, it's the world's fastest test rider. And it's like, thanks for that. Thanks yeah, for that, Neil. Yeah, Casey's like, a test rider for them too. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, like, 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 thanks for that, Neil. Where, where, where you stick your knife in there, mate? But um, yeah, absolutely right. Like, Lorenzo, it's, that was bizarre. That was... That was weird, man. It was weird that he'd started to had this unbelievable start to get himself in, in, into contention and into the win. Then he just faded completely while, while Dovi just stuck at it. It's, it was a very bizarre sort of incident um, where it's just another case of Lorenzo just not being able to get used to this bike. And again, I think alarm bells should be starting to ring right now. If Mikhaili Piro is keeping up with him, and uh, Andrea De Vizioso is winning the race at a canter um, for, for, for the most part. So, um, yeah, does anyone have Casey's number again, Bex? Any chance, you know? Uh, yep, yep, I, 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 I can be there. I can, I can assist in that. Bex is camped yeah, outside his house at the moment. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's still campaigning to do the special be... show about it. I will be, no, I won't be camped outside of his house, but I will be in the same country as him soon. Yeah, yeah, she had Bex is on her way down under. So, she's, uh, she's never mentioned that. In October, yeah. So if you're wondering why Bex is uh, absent in October, um, that is why. Um, I know I know she's absent a little bit on this show. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but she has a, she'll have a better reason in October. <laughs> Um, but anyway, here's the result then for the MotoGP race. Davizioso, the very popular winner from Vinales and Petrucci. Um, not the expected podium, or certainly uh, two-thirds of it. Uh, Rossi fourth, Bautista fifth, Marquez only sixth. Uh, Joan Zarco, who we haven't mentioned, um, came from 11th on the grid to seventh. Um, he was Cal Crutchlow's tip for the victory on uh, on Saturday. So, um, yeah, Cal didn't have a great weekend, even with his predictions. He got those badly wrong, too. Uh, Hoy Lorenzo, eighth. Piro, ninth. And Andrea Iannone, a better weekend for Suzuki. He finished in tenth uh, and was just 15 seconds off the win, which is a hell of a lot closer than they were at Le Mans. Um, Tito Rabat, where did he suddenly turn that pace from? He was 11th, having made it straight through to Q2 on the Saturday. Um, second of the Hondas, ahead of Scott Redding, Jonas Volga, Hector Barbara, and Jack Miller, who completed the points. Rabat beat his teammate Miller by eight seconds. 
uh, in the Grand Prix, which uh, took us all, I think, by surprise. Uh, Carol Abraham, Sullivan Gitoli, Loris Baz, Sam Lowes, and Bradley Smith all finished but failed to score points. Um, those of you 20 finishers, Paula Spargro, Alicia Spargro, amongst the non-finishers um, due to their various problems. Championship standings then. Vinales lead to, he's up to a century now, 105 points for him. That's 26 clear of Davizioso, who, as I mentioned earlier on, has jumped up four places with his win. He's gone from sixth to second. Um, Valentino Rossi stays in third, um, but he's jumped ahead of Pedroza now. Him and Marquez are tied for fourth. Uh, they're on 68 points apiece. That's 37 off the lead. Joan Zarco's four further back in sixth. Um, so uh, second to sixth in the championship is just covered by 15 points. But, of course, Vinales is a race clear of the lot of them. Uh, Jorge Lorenzo is seventh on 46 points, four ahead of Petrucci on 42. Folger's next up on 41. And Cal Crutchlow has dropped to 10th now in the points. He has 40. <laughs> Right, now let's take a deep seat, let's grab a drink, um, and take a very deep breath, because it's time to talk <laughs> Moto3. Um, oh my god! Now, 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 this may take a while. Um, as I said earlier on, if we uh, devoted five or ten minutes to every rider who fought for the win in this one, we'd still be here this time next week. Um, Dre, um, how many races have you ever seen that are anywhere near as good as that one? Not many. No. I thought. None ever. That, like Neil Hudson himself said it after the race. He's been riding bikes since he was eight years old, and that was the best race he had ever seen in his life. And that's it's in the conversation for me. That was that was that was that was, that was, well, that was better than no 2015 three uh, slide celebrating the lap too early. Um, that, was, that was an unbelievable race. That was. That was heart in mouth moment for twenty laps every single lap. It's like, yeah, okay, a lot of races do have big early battles at the start in Moto Three, but it just never went away. The whole race, the whole field, pretty much was right on top of each other the entire way through. It was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, you, you sort of watch races and you're kind of waiting for a group to to establish itself at the front for a group to break away, but. The group was the field, essentially. It never broke away uh, from the rest of the field. I mean, Mugello just always led itself back to, to fantastic Moto3 racing with that long straight and the slipstream down the home straight and the fast corners that mean that it's it's so flowing, so it's easy to follow other other guys. But even by Moto3 standards, this was friggin' insane. To have so many riders at the front of the, you know, at the leading pack able to, with a chance to win that at Grand Prix, I mean... We've we've spoke so many times before that the Moto Three is just a massive bunch of bees just buzzing around, and any one of them could do it on the last couple of corners. You just from one to seven, but to have so many more, but twenty four apparently, um, mm. in, in in that group with a possible chance of winning, it was absolutely incredible. And you know, half of them are going to finish without an actual race point. Um, and yet still been half in contention for for, for a victory. It's, it really says a lot about the class and how close the field is, but how talented the riders are and, and just how exciting and enjoyable it is. Yeah, yeah, there were guys who finished within two seconds of the race victory who didn't score points. Uh, Nicola Mantinelli was one of them. He was 1.8 seconds off winning the Grand Prix, um, which uh, 1.8 seconds off the race winning the MotoGP race would have had you on the podium. Um, it, it didn't even it didn't even earn, earn him a point um, in the Moto Three race. It was incredible. Ten different riders led it at one stage, and that's by count of leading over the line. There were more riders that led at some stage on a lap, um, but to be counted as having officially led the race, you need to have led over the line at the end of a Grand Prix. Ten riders did that, so that's basically a new leader every other lap. Um, in this Grand Prix. Fabio Di Gian Antonio, Romano Fanati, Marcos Ramirez, Jorge Martin, Darren Binder, Joan Mir, Nicolo Bollega, uh, Andrea Migno, Bulega. Juan Fran Guevara, and Philippe Ertl all led over the line at one point or another in the race. Um, and there were guys like Tatsuki Suzuki who led a, led a Grand Prix at one stage but didn't lead over the line. 
Um, there were so many others who fought for the win uh, at one point. Um, and, and Andrea Migno was the uh, man who drew the lucky lottery number out at the end of the Grand Prix because they were bubbling around like lotto, lotto balls at one stage in that race. And it was Migno that eventually came out first um, to win the race by just four hundredths of a second from Fabio Di Gian Antonio. And trade, I mean, there are stories, stories all the way through this leading group. We'll try and tell a few of them um, in the limited time we have. Um, but... It, it, we, we cannot ignore the, the, the distance that Andre Migno has come because it was only around this time last year that he finally started to emerge as a front-running guy in Moto3 when he got that podium at Assen, um That's in, in the race yeah. where Banyaya won. That was his first rostrum this time last year. Um, and, of course, Migno has been talked about a year or two back as, hang, why the hell did Sky VR46 drop Banyaya for this guy? You know, that was the way, yeah. that was the way he was being talked about, and he's finally come good with his first win. Exactly, and... Yeah, again, he was he was the third wheel in the in the VR forty six team a lot of the time, and last year he seemed to have that breakthrough at Aston where he very nearly won that race, and he's gone from strength to strength, and he's now a guy that's making a habit of this sort of performance, and it says it all really. It, it was it was a great great ride, and he was at the front, and he held off DG, and again the the draft like it, like. The, the Magello finish line was so beautifully put where, it, where you had a chance of leading over the line, but it wasn't guaranteed. And it worked out beautifully in this one because Mino just won it by 37 thousandths of a second over DG in the end. But um, as you say, Mino is like, he's looking like one of those guys that is just starting to put it all together now. And this was a well, well-deserved win. It was a fam- fantastic, critical last lap that got him into position where he could take the win like that. And yeah, he he, he, he rode with, with, with real class. And I have to say as well, the emotion on his face, yeah. like in, in, in some of the pictures in in, in Park Firm, Valentino Rossi, um, his hero was hugging him and you could see the tears in his eyes and you could see the, the, the sheer emotion flowing out of the visor on his helmet. Beautiful scenes. Congratulations, Andre. It was a fantastic performance. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> impossible to underestimate uh, and understate for an Italian rider riding for... The Valentino Rossi run team to win at Mugello. Um, you know that is that is the boyhood dream. The dream. Uh, if you're an Italian motorcycle racer, that is as good as it gets um, for Andrea Migno. And uh, yeah, if you if you ever if you go onto the MotoGP website where you can look at all the lap charts and all the information from this race, um, I'd encourage you to do so. It is great. It does look like a bit of a bingo sheet. The lap chart. Um, when you look at the, some of the positions of riders, like Andrea Andre Migno at the end of lap one was in thirteenth. Um, even with seven laps to go, he was down in eleventh. Um, with two laps to go, he crossed the line in ninth. Um, so at the end of eight, lap 18 of 20, he was in ninth spot. Um, then climbed himself up to fifth on the penultimate lap and then first by the end of the final lap. Um, you know, that's that just kind of shows you how many bikes and how close together they were because that would almost sound on paper as if there's no way he can win from there. Um, but Migno did it brilliantly. Um, he, he beat Dijan Antonio, um, as you mentioned, Dre. Um, but... <sighs> I, I, part of me really feels sorry for him. I mean, he equals his career best. He's been second a few times now in, in Moto3, including this race last year. Um, yeah. But 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 whoever you sort of read on Twitter or watch on TV, they always tell you how much of a delightful young man Fabio Di Gian Antonio is. Um, and there are very few people, certainly Count Crutchlow wouldn't have been one of them, um, but, there, <laughs> but there are very few riders who would have been so happy for the race winner within seconds of having missed out on a maiden win as Fabio Di Gian Antonio was. It's... Like I've, I've never seen this before in a bike race, and I've been watching bike races for God, fifteen, sixteen years now, and I've never seen like like you know when when a MotoGP video director is getting like that that close sort of finish, and he'll still stop the hard camera on the finish line to see who wins the photo. It's amazing that Mino wins the race, and you can still see on the hard camera shot, DG reach over and congratulate Mino on the hard camera. Like uh, maybe a second or two after he's crossed the line at 150 miles an hour, it's ridiculous. Um, but what what a class act Fabio was for that. I mean, it, it was a lovely gesture from from the young man. And again, like everyone has said in the panel that he's a, a truly ch- delightful, charming young man, and um, and it it shows because that was a, a very lovely gesture. Like again, within seconds of, of Andre Mino winning, he was, he was clearly delighted for him and delighted for his fellow Italian and. Yeah, that kind of says it all. The, the passion that comes out of this country is is overflowing. I mean, I'll give you another example. Petrucci, uh, we, we mentioned him a little bit earlier, but what? not only was there a giant number nine flag on, on the track when, when he was on the podium celebrating, 
well, you would never have guessed that in Rossi land, but also yeah. him in the press conference mm-hmm. afterwards where he said he'd give up his house for another MotoGP podium, mm. which is, it just shows the passion that these Italians have got is just unrivaled. And yeah, beautiful scenes. And yeah, again, uh, a class act, Fabio, and a, a great ride to finish in second. Again, that first win is definitely coming. Yeah, and yeah. it's a point worth making as well, Bex, so that we're talking about without flying the uh, the green, white, and red too much. Um, but it, of course, we had three Italian winners in the three classes, and an Italian won two in Moto three with Migno and Di Gian Antonio. This is a class that also features. Antinelli, he also features Dalla Porta, who's Italian, the junior world champion, uh, Romano Fanati, um, Enea Bastianini, our boy Bulliger. Um, mm-hmm. Itali- Bulliger. I- Italian motorcycle racing is in, I mean, it was it was going through a bit of a drought five or six years ago when it was all dominated by Spaniards, um, these classes, but the Italians are back and Italian motorcycle racing post Rossi is in safe hands. This is the thing, and I mean... We, we, we've had so many talented Spanish riders come onto the scene and now all of a sudden we're getting a flurry of, of Italian riders and it is really great to see that, you know, there's been one great, greatest of all time command the sport for so many years and you kind of wondered where the next person to turn to from from, from Italy was going to come from and now we've got a pick of a bunch uh, and it really is, uh, you know, exciting to watch the young kids and they're so full of life they they are like just if you watch video of uh of rossi being interviewed uh, back in like 2006 2007 and you watch it and he, in your, he gets really he gets excited now and i just i still laugh i don't know how many times i've listened to the word of him say happy i'm really happy i just mm. i'm sorry about the really bad italian accent but it just i love the fact that everyone <laughs> better than any we could come up with do you like that <laughs> you like that I, I don't know what it is it's just it's just like so carefree and relaxed and the Italians the way their persona is and the way they act around the paddock um, it is a sight to behold and I just wish certain other people really would take note and actually you know replicate how they are and how they they go about their race career because it, it, it is a joy to watch Mm. All, all we needed there, Bex, for and you I'm to was, all, names. no. All we needed there, Bex, was for you to you to modify your catchphrase and tell us to shut up in your face. Uh, that, that's all we really needed ah. there. Uh, in that ah, last shut answer. up in your face. Yeah, that's all. That's all. Like, there it is. Um, <laughs> don't, don't, don't encourage him. <laughs> like she needs any encouragement. Um, but yeah, but Valentino, we, we mentioned him, and of course, it's the VR46 team that won at the weekend, and he does deserve a lot of the credit for this. Not all of it, of course, but he does deserve a large chunk of the credit because when we think back, Dre, to that time when Spanish riders were dominating Modzo 3, um, there was a Team Italia. There was the Italian Federation team, which, of course, Romano Fanati debuted in. Um, and it wasn't exactly all that competitive all the time, was it? Um, it was, To be fair, it was, a, it was a federation that was living within its means, that was basically doing what it could to promote Italian talent. Um, but in VR46 now, and this is part of the reason why FMI, the Italian Federation, has taken a step back from Grand Prix Racing now, is that in VR46, there is now a, there is now a, a, a company, there is an organization with the resources um, to basically give a young, up-and-coming Italian racer everything they need to flourish in Moto3, as Migno is proving. It's it, it, it's great because I remember on like if you go to the four wheeled world right now like they're they're struggling like they they are riders over there that, that there's there's drivers that have incredible talent over there um, and yet have not had opportunities for, for because the Italian government is really struggling right now I mean Niano Trilli was the last probably great Italian that was in Formula One before you know, him and maybe Antonio Liuzzi who got Antonio Giovinazzi right now and he can't get his foot in the door right now. And he's a tremendous talent. It's the same. It's a similar deal in two wheels. But I'm glad that there is an organisation now that is willing to give these guys chance because Italy is producing talent now on the level of the Spanish, which is always a juggernaut in bike racing in the last five to ten years. With you know Lorenzo, Pedrosa, Marquez, Vinales, and of course there's, there's going to be more coming, obviously. But now the Italians have probably they've got Frankie Morbidelli probably is their headlining guy now. There's that's just probably going to be a MotoGP next season. And yeah, as it stands right now, they've got talent up and down the field. Pecco Bagnaia, you've got him there now. Andrea Mino, you still have Fanati, who who knows could still repair his, his fragmented career. So to even sp- got guys like Marini and Baldassari at the forward yeah, team who could come, come good. Strong. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's 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 half a dozen very solid Italians in the field now, and Rossi seems to put together a real nice circle of friends around him now, where he's got a lot of talent 
seemingly almost everywhere now. He's doing a really good job with that. And the Academy, is, I think, is starting to pay dividends. It's, it's probably going to have its first MotoGP ride the next year. Baldassare is a solid rider. Muka Marini seems to be getting better by the race in his second season in Moto2. And, yeah, like, they've got something here. They're, they're doing a very good job indeed. So, um, yeah, like it's, it's great to see the Italians really rising as a superpower again in, in bike racing. Yeah, which does give us hope that, of course, I think everyone's got one eye on the MotoGP, what MotoGP is going to look like post Rossi. Um, it's a big question for everyone, but certainly in terms of Italian um, flying that flag, I think there are going to be many, many riders who will be able to do that uh, in the future. It's just going to be a case of which one emerges from the pack because there are so many of them uh, at the moment, um, certainly in Moto3. Um it wouldn't be Moto3 without getting at least one Spaniard on the podium. Uh, in this case, it was a Spaniard who had never been up there before, Juan Fran Guevara, um, who completed the podium for the uh, the team and the bike that is always the easiest to spot in a Moto3 grid, um, the RB8 team with the uh, luminous white and blue and yellow um, uh, KTM that they run. Uh, Guevara taking his first podium. Um, having He's actually run up the front a few times this season, actually. He was taken out of the leading group by uh, Ertl in a Grand Prix this season in Qatar, the opening round he was taken out there. Um, so this has been a podium that's not been completely uh, uh, out of nowhere for, for Guevara. He's been up there a few times um, so far this season. Um, but another team that impressed Dre um, were the team that you've referred to a few previous occasions, team, as the... Uh, that's the team you always start with on the MotoGP video games, the uh, Platinum Bay Real Estate <laughs> team. Um, yes. And, uh, and they led the race through Marcos Ramirez, and although he faded, and I say faded, that's a relative term, he was still only 0.7 off the win, but he finished down in ninth. Um, <laughs> his, his teammate, uh, Darren Binder, came through on the final lap to finish fourth, equaling his career best. About time, Darren Binder had a had a solid result. He's been due one, really. Um, he's been he's been it's, it's fair. Like Binder's been in the mix for wins on two or three occasions yeah, already this out season. Podium spots twice this year. Yeah, it's that's bonkers because like Binder has really come along strong this season. My word, like what is the Platinum Bay Real Estate team doing? The the the, the factory team that, that are running these KTM's aren't doing. It's bizarre to me and. Yeah, again, maybe they got an energy drink or something. I don't know. Um, maybe that's where they're getting the money from. But it's, in any case, they're doing an incredibly good job right now. Like they have a very talented pair of riders. Marcus Ramirez has been probably been probably been the real surprise of the season in Moto Three more than anybody else. Um, and again, Darren Binder, who was you know seemed to show a bit of a flash last towards the end of the last season in Philip Island, where he had the other fourth place finish in his career, and. When you factor all of that in, yeah, they've got a really strong team in there now. I'd like to see how it progresses because Binder's been in in, in podium contention on multiple occasions, and Ramirez has had probably been the best KTM of the season so far. So, yeah, again, what's Akiyo done wrong this year with the, with the factory boys when all of a sudden when the Platinum Bay team have been so good? Mm. Yeah, I mean, Bex, it was one of those races given how many riders were at the front, and it was a bit of an un unusual and unfamiliar uh, podium. Yeah, it was one of those races where the championship fight kind of took a back seat for, for one week. Um, John Mir, who leads the championship, um, finished down in seventh. Uh, Aaron Cannett is now his nearest challenger in second, um, 34 points back. Cannett finished in fifth. John McPhee, who's there or thereabouts, he finished in between them in sixth. Um, Dijan Antonio is now up to third in the points, having finished second. Fanati, um, who's been up there for most of the races this season, finished 13th without doing a whole lot wrong, um, given how many bikes are up the front. Um, and Mino's kind of crept into championship contention now, but it has to be said, Bex, given how he looked so strong in the first two races, winning them at a canter, Joan Mir, um, even with that 34-point lead, there's a bit of hope here that he's perhaps not going to run away with this championship just yet. No, I don't think so. I mean... Your word, and I think it's the only way we can. It has to come back into into use this season to describe the Moto Three field. Is that I think most races are going to end up in a complete hectic smoshel. Yeah, well, we, we don't have yeah, to be family was... friendly now. We can call it a clusterfuck if you want. Um, but I think, I think that's what Moto Three uh, well, okay. pretty much is these days. We, we hear a bike love apologise for the language, and then uh, <laughs> who am I fucking kidding? I mean, I in no way or uh, condone such language. You never hear me <laughs> come out with anything. Bullshit. So <laughs> um, but I, I just think you know it, it's going to be so here, there, and absolutely sun everywhere. Um, for from now to the very end of the motor three uh, calendar, then 
everyone's going to be taking points off everyone. Whether he's got 34 points or not, he's not going to run away with it. And he's going to take, everyone's going to be taking points off each other. Can anyone get so close to bridge that gap? So I don't think he's going to run away with it solely from, from here to the end of the season. But with everyone beating everyone else on, on various race weekends, I don't see any one or two riders that are going to he's going to make the break to, 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 to bridge that gap to, to really give him a, a good push does that make sense yeah, I, so mean, I think he's just going to, kind of, going to be stagnant if, from, Mia, if Mia can kind of keep can, keep consistent then he might just have this I mean like I say 7th doesn't sound like an awful lot of um, of a result to shout about but he was only 0.5 off the win um, and his nearest championship contend- contender Canet was only 2 spots ahead of him um, and 2 tenths ahead of him in 5th so he only lost 2 points to Canet um, he lost 9 to Dijan Antonio but he was already 46 back anyway um, so Mia's just got to try and sort of manage this um, as the season goes on and if he's going to have a few more races where he has that level of dominance that he had um, for example at Le Mans after Fidati crashed in, in Qatar and in, in Argentina earlier in the season then John Mia still looks like the man to beat but I think we've, we've got enough riders here who could chase him down the likes of Canet, Dijan Antonio I think he's another rider once he wins one he'll win a few um, and Fanati, we all know he can win any given race when he puts his mind to it. He just only tends to do that twice or three times a year. Um, so, um, so yep. there are plenty, plenty of riders who could still make this a championship and chase John Mir down. One other rider, though, I wanted to really mention here, Dre, before we move on from Moto Three. Um, and if, if one rider's fortunes kind of encapsulate what Moto Three is about this weekend, it was Jorge Martin, um, who qualified on pole position on the Saturday. Got a grid penalty, which relegated him to 13th. He then went from 13th on the grid up to 1st by the end of lap 4, and then fell all the way down to 15th again and only scored one point. The whole game Martin experienced. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, that, that, that was a bizarre weekend for Martin. I mean, I think 12th place was a harsh penalty in the first place for um, for his infractions off track, but... Uh, he, he was uh, he was in the lead by the end of lap 4, which was just bonkers. It was a ridiculous start from Martin. Butter. Like I am, yeah, he was he was just carving the entire field up like crazy, and then all of a sudden, when then the race got a bit elbows out, he got swallowed up. Unfortunately, it was it was a real survival of the fittest sort of environments out there, and Martin Martin was one of the big victims of that. But uh, yeah, like, like there's no real shame in finishing no. 15 this one really because I mean it, again he was a second and a half off the win what more do you want him to do? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I say, I think I think you hit the nail on the head in that he's he's a guy who. I mean, he's, I think he's shown on pure pace. He's as quick as anyone in Moto3 this season. He's had, what, four poles out of six? Um, or four poles before his penalty, which took one off him. Um, but in pure qualifying, he's been quickest in qualifying four times in six races now this year, Jorge Martin. Um, and it just seems as if he's got the pace. But when it gets a bit frenetic and a bit close, he gets beaten up a bit um, in these Moto3 races. And that's perhaps something that he's going to have to learn uh, if he's going to make an inroad in that championship lead. Martin is seventh in the championship at the moment. 48 points off the lead. Um, so he could still close that down if um, John Mir has a few more of those races where he's down in sort of sixth and seventh. Um, but let's run you through the result then. Um, this is quite a result if you've not seen it, Moto3. Migno, the winner, um, by 37 thousandths of a second from Dijan Antonio in second. Guevara, third, point one off the win. Then came Binder and Canet, who needed a photo finish to split them for fourth and fifth. They were two thousandths apart. Uh, Binder got the verdict, um, 0.362 off the win. John McPhee in sixth, John Mir seventh. Ayumu Sasaki, who ran as high as third at one point, finished eighth. He's the Asia Talent Cup and Red Bull Rookies champion. Uh, Marcos Ramirez, ninth. And Nicolo Bulliga, tenth. Just 1.1 seconds covers the top ten, which was closer than the top ten were in qualifying. Uh, and Air Bastianini in eleventh, um, 1.2 off the win. Then came Ben Schneider. Uh, they needed a photograph as well to split them. Fanati in 13th. Ertl 14th. He was leading with two to go and finished 14th. Jorge Martin 15th. Final point. 1.5 off the win. We also saw Adam uh, Nicola Antonelli, Marco Bezzecchi, Adam Noradin, Lorenzo Della Porta, Jakob Kornfile, Tony Arbolino, all in that leading group at the end, which were covered by 3.476 seconds. First to 21st in that race and that doesn't even include the likes of Tatsuki Suzuki who was in the leading group but crashed with a, a lap to go as did Albert Arenas um, and Jules Danilo was also in that leading group before he got took out um, with 11 laps to go um, so so many there were basically two thirds of the field were in that leading group at the finish it was that kind of race championship standings then look like this Mia leads it by 34 he has 108 points to Canet 74 Dijan Antonio is three points further back in third Three points further back to Fanati and Migno, who are tied on 68. 
John McPhee is 6th on 63, and Jorge Martin has 60. Guevara is up to 8th on 50. Ramirez is down to 9th. Despite finishing in the top 10, he's dropped a spot to 9th on 43. And Anea Bastianini is 10th in the championship on 36 points, already 72 off the lead, um, which is amazing given that Bastianini moved to Australia Galicia with the hope of challenging for the championship. It ain't going to happen this year. Um, right then, Dre, on to Moto2 um, and a, another first-time winner in uh, in this class, Mattia Passini taking the victory. Um, and this was another victory, much like Moto3, that was riddled with emotion. Absolutely. And um, gosh, uh, not only does, was he dedicating it to his, his good friend Marco as well, but it was his first win in eight years, his last time he won. A, a, a race at, at all was this very was this very race? I think in two thousand eight, I want to say it was. Um, with, again, with Marco Simoncelli on the podium with him, yeah, yeah, yeah. Simoncelli finished second that day. Um, yeah, actually, I think it was two thousand two thousand eight, I believe it was. Yeah, so yeah, it was his first win in 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 God, uh, donkey's nine years, years. But, uh, nine years. Um, yeah, so yeah, two thousand nine actually was the last time he won. He won a race. He was in two thousand nine Italian Grand Prix again. It was Bassini, Simoncelli, Bautista on the podium back then. They were they were twenty four seconds ahead of the rest That's of the field. That's how long ago it was. Bautista was in the intermediate class. <laughs> yes, um, exactly. And again, it's been a long time coming for Matteo Bassini. Who, like the last couple of rounds, he's really looked a lot stronger this season on the Atalanta's bike and. Um, yeah, like again, I, I thought, okay, this, this is a surprise. This guy's up the front. Like, I've not seen Bassini up the front like this in a long time. And again, he, he just didn't go away. It, it, he was always there, and it always looked like he had a little bit more in him compared to Alex Marquez and um, Thomas Lutie, who was in that leading pack of three for the win. And like, it was also worth mentioning, like the double pass he pulled oh, yeah. off that last lap of the gods from Bassini on the, on the, on the last lap where he's gone round the outside and then around the inside down the hill um passing both marquez and luti in the space of two corners was beautiful riding of the highest quality from matteo Pasini. it was it was beautifully done he, he, i think he deserved the win for that double pass alone quite frankly um and i'm glad he did it was a, it was a one of them and again such emotion that came with that victory um but yeah absolutely deserved a f- fantastic ride for Pasini. Mm, yeah, he dedicated the win to, to Marco Simoncelli after the Grand Prix. Um, you, you kind of feel, given how emotional he was, that this is the kind of dedication he's wanted to make ever since Marco Simoncelli lost his life um, in 2011. And obviously, sadly, it's taken him six years to be able to finally do this. But he certainly hadn't forgotten um, Matteo Pacini. He said after the race, um, I'm still here, was his first comment. Uh, it wasn't easy coming back, but it's great to be still here and to come back here in Mugello of all places. To be here today is a good job, I think. I dedicate my win to Sitch, uh, that's Simoncelli, uh, because without him here pushing me for all these years, I don't think I would be here today. Um, Matteo Pacini for so long has been the rider that you always hear um, Keith and Jules on BT Sport talk about as the rider that always has to um, handle the brake and clutch with one arm. Um, on his uh, on his on his handlebars, um, yeah, Pasini. That's always been his calling card. That's always been what people sort of tag him with. In yeah. Two. It, it's worth explaining why this is um, for those that haven't heard the story. He's got serious nerve damage uh, in one of his arms, so he has a specially adapted motorcycle that has the uh, clutch and front brake operated with his left hand rather than one on either side uh, of the bike, which. If you listen to anyone who knows anything about riding a motorcycle, they say that you shouldn't really be able to do that. Um, it's not really something you should be able to do and still win Grand Prix with it. Um, but but that's what pasini has been able to do. It was an incredible result from him. And as you say, that double overtake on the final lap was as good as anything we'll see this year. The round the outside, as you mentioned, um, of the right to get the inside for the left uh, of Casanova Savelli to take Marquez. And then at the very next corner, Arabiata, he goes up the inside of Thomas Luzzi. And these aren't slow ridings he's passing. Uh, on the final no. lap, these are these are two of the best in the class. Um, that that that, that, that uh, Pasini is passing um, to win the Grand Prix, um, and um, yeah, a, a race that I say was fraught with emotion, and uh, I don't think anyone was there wasn't a dry eye in the house to see Pasini win that Grand Prix. Thomas Luti second though, Bex, and although he hasn't won a Grand Prix at all this season, and Franco Morbidelli, the championship leader, has won four. Luti's suddenly only thirteen points off the championship lead, and that one I think has crept up on us that Luti. In true Luti fashion, under the radar, has kind of put himself in championship <laughs> contention, hasn't he? Yeah, the guy had back to win the championship. Yeah, so did I. Um, oh man, he really has just kind of come out of nowhere, and and we both said at the start 
about the season was he, if he can't win it this season, then is, is he ever going to win it? Because in, in all honesty, at the start of the season on paper, not, his, his most fierce rivals had all moved up to, to my GP for Tom Lutie. But for, for one way or another, it just hasn't quite gone his way. But we're still closing. And we've got a long way to go at the end, at the end of the season. Could still be with another prediction. Um, but when is this guy ever going to learn that we just want to give him some bloody credit? I just, I'm, I'm fed up with the, the times where he crosses the checker flag and you just you don't know where he's been all race weekend because he's just gone so under the radar. And and yet again, Michelle was exactly the same. But Dre, who did you back to uh, to win the Moto Two Championship? I went with Frankie Morbidelli. Ah. Well, this is going to be interesting. This is going to be close, though, isn't it? I mean, what's interesting here this season, Dre, is that Moby Daly, as I say, he's won four out of six um, this season, and those races that he won were all consummately beautifully won. Um, you know, he wasn't exactly pushed, apart from maybe Argentina on the final lap. He won those with ease. Um, but the two races that he hasn't won, he's kind of gone missing. Of course, he went literally went missing into the gravel trap at Jerez. Um, but it was kind of the big, the big anomaly of the Sunday at Mugello was where did Franco Moby Daly go? Um, because he never had the pace to run at the front. He was a very distant and very lonely fourth. And mm. by virtue of that, and as I say, by his stealth, if nothing else, and consistency of podiums, Lutie's within striking distance of him. This is this has been a very weird season so far. Like it's 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 if Frankie kept it upright in her F, he'd have a very comfortable championship lead right now. Mm. Like that. That one DNF, I think, is starting to play into Thomas Lutie's hands a bit more than we thought on the calculators. Because, again, it's easy to say, yeah, Morbidelli's won four races, but it's also easy to think Lutie's not had a bad race so far this season, really. Um, and some, in some cases, some points are better than no points at all. And, again, Lutie's just gone plus seven on, on Morbidelli there again. So... It's it's a weird one. Like Luti is putting together the consistency, and more with that, he ended up finishing three and a half seconds off the off the win in the end. He he was always like maybe a tenth or two off where he probably needed to be, and it was it was weird. I was like, given that Frankie's always been a guy of at like incredible outright speed, like the fact he was so subdued was very unlike Frankie in 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 that race, and surprising to see that he was so far off the pace in the end um and especially given his teammate alex marquez who's been playing catch up all season long was so convincingly quicker than him so um yeah i don't know if that's if that's just the one off we'll get the old frankie back at catalina we'll have to wait and see but uh certainly an eyebrow raiser yeah thomas luti you're quite right luti has had five podiums out of six um, so far, Impressive. none of those podiums were wins, unfortunately, for Luti. He's gone second, third, second, eighth, third, second. Um, and that eighth was the race that Morbidelli crashed in. He had a bad, he, that's as bad as it's been for Luti. He was eighth at Jerez. Um, and had Luti won that Grand Prix in Morbidelli's absence, Luti would lead the championship now. Um, but it just tells you that consistency pays. Um, and I know Bex has told us this before in, in championship battles. Um, but it's amazing how four wins can basically almost be cancelled out if you have one DNF. Uh, Morbidelli with four wins is 13 points ahead of Luti, who's had none so far um, this season. They're kind of away and gone with it. The top two are clear. They're 22 clear of Marquez in third. Marquez finished third, Dre, at the Mugello at the weekend. And uh, is it a little too simplistic or is it right on the money to say he just got beaten up on that final lap? I think that's what it was. I mean, it was it was more an incredible last lap for Matteo Fassini than anything else. Um I don't. I don't think Alex Marquez or Marquez Tom Lutie did lead into it, didn't he? He led into the yeah, final lap. Led into that final lap. Um, it, I don't think it was anything more than just Bassini putting together a fantastic final lap, uh, an inch perfect final lap, and like Marquez didn't really do anything wrong. Uh, he probably was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he just. Mugello, the second half of Mugello, it's hard to pass around. It's very hard to pass on the on the second half of Mugello on faster bikes and. It showed it here on in this one. So, yeah, I think Alex is going to take that. He's going to take that result. It was not a bad result finishing further and being a tenth off the win. He he seemed pretty jovial about it um, afterwards. So, 
I wouldn't read too much into that if you're Alex Marquez. That's a solid result. You beat your teammate. Yeah, you you were you're back in title contention again. Um, yeah, take it where you can get it. Like, like Pacini was just a little bit better on the day, and Luti is Luti. You know, he's always going to be in the mix. Hmm. So, although I think if I'm Marquez, though, I don't know. I don't. I, don't, I, don't, I literally don't know what he said after the race. He might have said this. He might have been quite happy. But if Morbidelli is going to have a bad day and finish down in fourth, you want to take full advantage of that and get the twenty-five if you can. Um, and then, then it's a twelve-point gain on Morbidelli. As it is, he only gained what three. Uh, on Morbidelli, on one of Morbidelli's worst days, yeah. he's probably gonna have all season. That might come back to haunt Marquez. You know, if, if Luti pretty much did by finishing second, um, but I think both of those guys at the end of the season might wish that when Morbidelli had his bad day, they paid it, you know, punished him to the full and took the twenty-five points rather than being beaten to the win by Pacini, who, let's face it, probably isn't gonna challenge for the championship at the end of the season. Um, taking nothing away from Pacini, who was brilliant on that final lap. Um, you, you do wonder whether Luti and Marquez may regret not winning that race while Morbidelli struggled. Um, KTM were back in form at the weekend with uh, Miguel Oliveira finishing fifth, but we have to talk about his teammate, um, who um, Bex has had a pretty awful season, Brad Binder, all told, with injury. Of course, he had that horrible arm injury where he broke it in preseason testing, came into the start of the season um, injured, found out after the uh, Grand Prix of the Americas that the plate in his arm had moved, so he needed surgery on it again. Um, uh-huh. so, so we haven't seen him since Cota um, made his return at Mugello qualified 23rd so we're kind of sat here thinking yeah Brad's still not fully fit came from 23rd to 10th on Sunday oh man I feel so sorry for Brad Binder coming off as the Mo- 03 champion and you just think yeah he can he could really really impress in Moto2 this season I think he's such a talented talented rider and he bided his time well, he's come up at the right time, and literally everything that could have gone wrong for him has gone wrong, and that injury has just absolutely curtailed his, his season for me, um, especially when it all went wrong and it, it set him back even further. But it just goes to show the grit and determination that Brad Binder resiliently showed all of last season um, when he claimed his Moto3 title, to, to then come back after a horrific injury um, and one that has got to be seriously, seriously de- uncomfortable. Um, even now, coming back, he, he can't be riding in in much pleasure at the moment because of just how heavy these bikes are and how much pressure is put on your forearm. If you've got that plated and it, it's not 100% secure, you've got that dare in the back of your mind, you can't be riding you know, in, in a lot of comfort at the moment. And to get into 10th position um, and score a nice haul of points... Um, and just really get a top 10 finish um, after what has been a torrid season so far for him, after a, after a pretty poor qualifying. It's just an, an incredible performance for him. And I hope that we get to see the true Brad Brinder now. Absolutely. He stays injury free um, for the rest of the season. And I know it's kind of put the kibosh on, on what could have been, but... We've always got next year, um, and and hopefully then that it can be a little bit more improvement, and he can and he can stay fit because it was just horrendous timing for it to happen like that, and then for it to to have to be redone again because it went drastically wrong and it had moved. I mean, I can't imagine the pain that he must no, have been in just... when the pain when the when the, the plate had moved in his forearm. That must have been horrendous. That probably was worse than actually breaking it. Yeah, and we like... we shouldn't forget as well, Dre, that in that race that the plate moved or that weekend, Brad Binder finished ninth in Argentina that weekend. Um, Ridiculous. As, as well. And then to make his comeback, qualify 23rd and finish 10th. I mean, he's down in 17th in the points at the moment, Binder, because he's missed three rounds. But I, I'm just happy that given how horrendously unlucky this guy has been so far this season, we are still seeing Brad Binder up the front. And Brad Binder is still getting that opportunity on that KTM to show what he's all about. Because making that jump up from Moto 3 to Moto 2 isn't easy when you're fully fit, let alone when you're injured. Exactly, he's had a mountain of, of awful luck to start this season. He's like, like nothing about Binder's season has been straightforward getting into Moto2 and, and again, the steep learning curve that comes of that. I mean, it is a class where talent can often go to die because of just how hard it is to be competitive. And yet here we are, Brad Binder has been nothing short of exceptional given the circumstances and given... Like a, a very very nasty arm injury that's gets has plagued him all season long, and yet multiple top ten finishes. Brilliant stuff from Brad Binder. Yeah, he's uh, he's doing a, a cracking job given the circumstances, and yeah, Francesco Bagnaia is leading the way quite comfortably in Moto Two as the leading rookie. He's on fifty three points because he didn't score 
uh, in the Italian Grand Prix because he crashed out. Um, ended up finishing 22nd after he remounted. Um, but you've got Quattararo, Binder and Navarro who also had a good weekend. He had his best round so far. He finished 9th at the weekend uh, in Mugello. So um, a few of the rookies are starting to really get it together. And I think we all want to see Brad Binder um, show what he's capable of because the brief glimpses we've had so far in Moto2, he's done a very solid job. He just deserves a bit of luck. He just deserves a run of races where he's injury-free. Um, and we'll see what Brad Binder is all about. Um, Moto2 result then, Bataya Pacini the winner from Luti and Marquez just a, point, a tenth of a second covered the podium uh, Morbidelli was three and a half seconds further back in fourth then came Oliveira in fifth on the first of the KTMs Luca Marini continues to impress in sixth Dominic Egger to seventh on the first of the suitors Simone Corsi eighth on the first of the speed ups then came Navarro and Binder rounding out the top ten the rest of the points were taken up by Marcel Strotter uh, Hafish Sayarin Isaac Vinales Remy Gardner who was the only Tech 3 rider to start the race because Xavi Vieja had to pull out through injury and Xavier Simeon, 15 to take the final point um, in that one. Championship standings then. Morbidelli's lead, as I mentioned earlier on, is down to 13 points over Luti. Marquez is a further 22 back in third. Uh, Miguel Oliveira is eight further back in fourth. Then comes Bagnaia in fifth, who, as I mentioned, no scored. Matei Pessini has jumped all the way up to sixth on 49 points, three ahead of Agata and eight ahead of Nakagami, who, as Dre mentioned earlier on, was taken out in a horrendous first lap crash at the final corner of Puccini by Lorenzo Baldassari. Thankfully, both riders escaped mm -hmm. injured. Uh, Luca Marini in ninth and Simone Corsi's tenth on 35 points. Right, on to the news, uh, and we will stay with Moto2 for the news, um, because the big news that broke over the course of that Mugello weekend surrounded the future engine supplier to the Moto2 Class Dre, and um, as if there was enough British focus in, in, in MotoGP paddocks these days, we're going to have even <laughs> more, because Triumph are going to supply the Moto2 engines from 2019 onwards, um, and... I guess the most interesting thing about this story, we were talking about it before we started this show, is that for so many years, ever since the inception of Moto2, which was back in 2010, um, we've always had these clunky 600cc Honda Supersport engines that are pretty uh, pretty old by now. Um, and they, they aren't designed for Moto2 engines. They're Supersport engines that have been shoehorned into a Moto2 chassis. Um, yeah. But it looks now with Triumph on board for three years, from 2019 onwards, as if we're going to actually have a prototype Moto2 spec engine designed specifically for this class and for this racing. Yeah, exactly. I think that was always the the long term plan was to you know, and like I've like I've never been a big fan of the engines in Moto2. I don't think they're fast enough for what they do. And the Moto2 chassis is a lot bigger and a lot heavier than a a, a, a super sport bike. Do make a great noise uh, though. Oh yeah, they're great. They're great for noise. I mean, I've, I've heard them in person. They are incredible, um, noise wise. But a swarm uh, of wasps. Yeah, exactly. It's like someone's just flying up Paddock Hill Bend. It's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's, the noise is great, but it's just not a good fit for what the class is trying to do. It's a super sport engine in a chassis that's a lot bigger than a super sport chassis normally is. So it, it just it just feels out of place. So you you want you want it you want Moto Two to be a feeder series. You want it to be the the next best thing to Moto GP. Which is full of prototypes as it is. Why not just have a prototype Moto Two, mm, exactly. like that, like a full a full prototype spec series, so to speak. So yeah, I'm, I'm down for that. Yeah, it's been a good couple of weeks for Triumph, hasn't it? With fourth and fifth for the World Super Sport team at Donington the other week, and and now they've got the Moto Two. Uh, engine deal it's kind of been an open it's been like the worst kept secret in grand prix motorcycle racing for a, for a while now that triumph looked to be the front runners that there weren't many other contenders out there it has to be said of course honda no longer really are building these kind of engines anymore which is why they wanted out in the first place um yamaha are really the only manufacturer that have come to the table with a new super sport bike in recent years with that new r r6 so they were perhaps the only other contenders but i don't think there was ever any real great motivation or, or want from their side to do this um so trying from step forward um, and 
and we wish them all the very best and um it's going to be an operation run out of britain but also out of thailand i believe where they have um factories over there uh, and of course they're going to supply the engines and then of course it's over to dorna um who will then take over the the running of those and um they've done such a good job with the moto 2 engines because i mean in what in seven years dre of, of moto 2 races with these honda engines and we know honda yeah. engine, honda engines are prone to blow up every now and again but how many times have we ever seen a moto 2 engine go pop i can't remember it ever happening no, but next to next to zero, it's ridiculous. Yeah, given that they absolutely scream at full pelt as well, they they the Mono Two riders absolutely ring the light, ring the neck out of them, um, and they're they're screaming for their lives. And yeah, the reliability of them has been absolutely outstanding. So let's hope that Triumph can can kind of match that. Um, BSB News: Jason O'Halloran has um, been making the headlines because he set the fastest time at the uh, official test that took place this week at Snetterton, um, the Snetterton Three Hundred Circuit, which hosts around. Uh, next month um the british Superbike championship returns in a couple of weeks at, at knock hill in scotland and i know however and quickest as um honda look to try and get their shit together basically they've had a solid enough start in bsb certainly a better start than they've had in the world superbike championship where the new fireblade is taking its time to get up to speed it's still kind of getting itself up to speed isn't it in world superbikes but in bsb uh, the honda racing team really look as if they're making progress or halloran quickest at uh, the test earlier this week ahead of glenn Irwin on the bys at jacati panagali um Leon Haslam and Luke Mossy were there or thereabouts, and uh, I don't think anyone ever doubts that they're going to be up the front uh, when we get to knock kill. But um, a nice confidence boost for the Honda team, for O'Halloran, to set the fastest time in that test. Uh, a tenth of a second clear of Erwin. Jake Dixon, fresh from his uh, wildcard outing um, in the World Superbikes, he was third, ahead of Shaky Byrne, the uh, reigning champion, in fourth. Kuba Smirts, fifth, then came John Hopkins in sixth. Luke Mossy was seventh, a second and a half off the pace. Um, but expecting to be right up the front um, when British Superbikes returns at Knock Hill um, in a week's time, um, June 16th, 17th, and 18th um, for British Superbikes. So as you heard this podcast, it will be around a week away. Um, now, we're going to actually bring you some Speedway news um, because we've um, during this show, while we've been talking to you, um, we used to do this regularly when we back, used to be a live show once upon a time, um, but we've actually had a tweet in, Bex. Um, so we're going to throw this one over to you um, because um, we, we mentioned earlier on that you were um, on your hobby horse talking about motocross accidents in uh, in motorcycle racing for, for Grumpy Riders, and uh, that prompted Joe Ellis to tweet us at motorsport underscore 101 to say, does this mean we finally, in capitals, get a piece on the Speedway GP season so far? Um, so since you're here, Bex... Um, this is your opportunity now to tell us what we've missed. If we haven't been watching Speedway GP so far this season, and we know you have because you've been cheering on a certain match, say Yanofsky, what have we missed? Never. <laughs> Bex has gone silent on us. Bex has been so keen to tell us what's been going on in Speedway that she's gone all silent on us. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I forgot that my microphone was on mute. Um, oh. And I was actually like chomping, chomping at the bit to get bit, in, yeah. <laughs> in there. Um, then, uh, yeah, we uh, have had three rounds of the Grand Prix season so far. In actual fact, the fourth round is happening this weekend. And shock horror, I am at work. Yeah. Um, so if anyone is free uh, to watch, tune into BT Sport this Saturday. So tomorrow, as you are listening to this, I'm assuming it's going to go out on Friday night if we record. It will certainly be out by the time Thursday the Speedway evening. happens. So, um, yeah, what time I is should hope Saturday so. tea time on BT Sport? It'll be Saturday tea time, yes, for the Czech Republic Grand Prix. So, so far, um, it's been an incredible season. Um, well, not if you're I, great I, obviously, well, no, not if you're not in great <laughs> handcock, but we are only three rounds in. Um, so far this season, I would not have tipped Patrick Duda to be top in the standings. Um, alas, that is what he is doing. It is so close. At the moment, just three or uh, four points separate the top four and five riders from Patrick Dudek um, leading the championship. Matt Zainowski has crept himself into the top four after two fantastic Grand Prix. He absolutely smashed it at Warsaw um, a couple of weeks ago in Poland. And yeah, I was having slight heart palpitations because at the start of the meeting, I thought, I'll have a bet on Magic. His odds are quite good. And then I realised that he's in Poland. And nine times out of ten, when we go to Poland, Magic scores four points. And I speak of that from experience because when I went to Gorge after watching him a couple of years ago, in 2015, he scored four points. At Warsaw last year, I'm pretty sure he scored four points. So it's kind of just thought, oh, I'm not going to waste my money. I'll put my money on someone else. Um, Magic, I was at work. 
made the final and I had a lot of people coming in and rubbing in, oh, have you seen Amy's done, have you seen Amy's done? And I was like, no, I don't want to know. And I was like, I could have won a lot of money uh, to take to Australia with me had I have bet on him. <laughs> thankfully or unthankfully, depending on which way you want to look at it, um, he finished second. So I didn't, and I weren't going to have him each way. So I, I didn't lose out in that sense of the word. And he, he kept his very pretty looks because I would have probably kicked his pretty Polish head in in, in Cardiff had he had cost that much money. Um, but he rocketed himself up in Warsaw, died for pills in um, Latvia last time out. Again, made the final, had a horrendous crash um, himself. Oh gosh, this is going to really test my memory now. Um, Doily and uh, Bartosz Smarzlik. See, this is great. This is what happens. This is what happens, Joe. What happens when we when we send Bex questions on the fly, um, Joe? Yes, Joe, you just get a massive yeah. like at, <laughs> at jhlis eighteen Bex on Twitter if you want to send him your uh, angry tweet tweets later on. Yes. Uh, yes, but he um, had a massive magic had a massive crash and Douglas and managed to get on okay. But Patrick Dudek is in the lead. Greg Hancock having a torrid time in defending his championship, uh, world championship status at the moment, but we are still at very early days. And it's Cardiff in about 40 odd days' time. So, Joe, if you're free and you're coming down, tweet me and let me know. You'll probably find me in the local Weatherspoons with a massive Polish flag. Come and say hello. Yeah, the Champions League final, the uh, the precursor to the main event that is this British Speedway GP, uh, the Principality Stadium coming up in a month's time. Um, yeah, there you go, Joe. I um, hope that's answering questions. See, we don't really have a mailbag on Bike Live. What we do is we just pick out one question at random and just devote an entire segment to it. It's like, 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 you're like, you're like, welcome. like that Lee Evans you segment. You asked me what had happened, yeah. and I've got like three Grand Prix to talk about. Like, you know, like that Lee Evans sketch on stage where he goes, no, just you. Um, it was kind of like that, where we we devoted an entire show to uh, to Joe's question. Hope that answered your question, Joe. And uh, yeah, when Bex returns in uh, six weeks' time, we'll cover Speedway again. Um, but uh, but on to on to other news and the Isle of Man TT um, because that's been uh, well, I say it's been taking place this week. It's been taking place when the rain has been absolutely pissing it down on the Isle of Man, which it has been for a lot of this week. Um, very few races have actually taken place now. Unfortunately, um, given that this is the Isle of Man TT, you probably know where this uh, this segment of the show is going. Um, it, it kind of feels remiss, unfortunately, to talk about um, race results and race victories. Um, you know, Chinson, um, one of those to, to taste victory this week, uh, as he so often does at the TT. Um, given that, once again, unfortunately, the Isle of Man TT has um, been overwhelmed by tragedy. Three riders this week um, have sadly lost their lives. Um, the Dutch rider, Joachim van den Hoek, um, lost his life um, at the age of 28 after crashing um, earlier this week. Uh, he died uh, after crashing uh, yesterday. Um, he isn't the only rider, as I mentioned. Two others have lost their lives um, over the course uh, of this week. Um, there was an accident yesterday at the 33rd milestone. Um, which saw the uh, second Supersport race cancelled um, as a result of that combined with the bad weather um, that we got uh, over at the TT. Um, Alan Bonner was unfortunately the rider who lost his life um, in that crash, and we also lost Davy Lambert last weekend as well. Uh, all three riders, unfortunately, succumbing to their injuries, suffered at the Alaban TT. Uh, unfortunately, it is a part of the territory, I'm afraid, at the Alaban TT. It is such an incredible and you know breathtaking spectacle but unfortunately riders are quite literally um putting their lives on the line um to go and race at this incredible sporting event and unfortunately three have perished this week our, our thoughts go to the families of alan bonner uh, david lambert and joachim vandenhoek who lost their lives uh, this week uh, as i mentioned it kind of feels remiss to talk about the race results um Given that the bad time this podcast goes out, the uh, final day of racing will have taken place, including, we hope, the senior TT on Friday. That is, of course, weather permitting. And by the time you hear this podcast, you will know whether that race has taken place or not. Um, so, um, as I say, given what has happened, it kind of doesn't feel right to be talking about race results at the Isle of Man TT, given the tragedy that has unfolded uh, on the island this week. Our thoughts and prayers to the families of those who unfortunately lost their lives there this week. Uh, right now, let's look ahead to this weekend to finish off uh, this week's edition of Bike Live. As Bex mentioned, the Speedway GP 
uh, series will be in action on Saturday night, but also this weekend sees back-to-back MotoGP race, race weekends for the first time this season as the uh, circuit descends upon Montmelo, the Catalan Grand Prix in Barcelona. Um, and this will be a race weekend, Dre, that will also be uh, overwhelmed by an awful lot of emotion, um, given that this is the first time that MotoGP has raced uh, in Catalonia since the tragedy of last season, the tragic weekend which saw us lose Luis Salom to injury. And... Uh, You've got to think that uh, Mexicano 39 will be in uh, the centre of all of our thoughts throughout this weekend. No kidding. Um, it, the t- time flies. I didn't realise until, until mm. on the Friday it had been a year since his passing. It had gone. It's, it's gone so quickly. And um, yeah, it's going to be obviously it's, it's, it's going to be an emotional, difficult weekend for everybody involved. And again, I, I hope we get some great racing to compensate for that. Um, good because there's a there's a lot going there's a lot emotionally going into this race there's a lot going on behind the scenes on the track off the track as well and yeah I, I hope it's it's a positive weekend for everybody mm, yeah it's it's it, and, and given what we've talked about already on this show Bex and given how unpredictable MotoGP uh, and indeed the the lower classes have been uh, Moto three in particular have been recently it's almost impossible to kind of lay your hat on anyone to say they're going to win this weekend. Of course, it's a home Grand Prix for Maverick Vinales, as we mentioned earlier on. Um, it's the Catalan Grand Prix. It's, it's as close as you can get to a home Grand Prix for him, even though there are four Spanish rounds. This is pretty much the, the home round of the four for him um, this weekend. Um, but it's it's not as simple as that to say that it's Mavericks, the guy to beat this weekend, because, of course, this circuit has been modified since the tragedy of last year. Of course, the uh, the hairpin is now used at turn 10 rather than the uh, longer, more sweeping, faster corner, which suits the Yamahas a little bit more. The hairpin suits Hondas and Ducatis a little bit more. Uh, we also have the chicane at the end of the lap, so we don't have the two fast sweeping right-handers to close the lap. We have the right into a left-right chicane, um, which may well, certainly did last year, it brought the Hondas more into play. Um, of course, we saw Mark Marquez challenge Valentino Rossi for the victory all the way to the end. So, um, yeah, you kind of get the feeling this is a Grand Prix as much as any that we've seen so far. This is almost an impossible one to predict because you can make an argument for Ducati, for Honda and Yamaha in this one. Yeah, and this is this is the reason why uh, Catalonia is such a great track. Uh, again, you, you, you don't know really what you're going to expect because there are strengths and weaknesses for each top manufacturer. Um for various sectors of this racetrack so it's going to be a difficult one to swallow obviously with what uh dry very expertly um talked about there um and with a lot of class uh, it's going to be hard hmm. going back um following the events of what happened last year um and it's going to be i'm sure a very difficult broadcast for everyone um part of the bt sport team out there that you know, they're undoubtedly going to cover something. They're going to do some sort of tribute. And it's going to be a, a really hard emotional thing to cover. But we're still going to get the action on track. And I'm 90% sure that, you know, uh, every and dedicate it to Louis Salam. I mean, that I, I always think back to the gesture that, that Mark Marquez did last season when he mm. switched his numbers round. Um, and, and that, for me, is one of the, the most prominent things I remember from last season's race, because if I'm completely honest, it's a, it's a complete blur uh, mm. following the events of what happened over the weekend. Um, I, I don't really remember anything other than, you know, the tributes that piled into. It's going to be a, a hard race weekend to, to, to watch and to, to absorb in, but it's going to be one that everyone's going to have such a, a big thing to, to win for, 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 for Lewis Salam. So... Mm-hmm. It's going to be a difficult one to call, and I can't call it. No, um, it, it, I, have, I have no idea who's going to win. So no, I, I'm, I'm struggling. To call I look it as forward well. I mean, to it all unfolding. What we do tend to get, uh, Dre, we do tend to get very, very good MotoGP races at, at, at Catalonia. Last season's, yes. um, although many obviously it does, it does kind of sort of fade into insignificance given what else happened that weekend. Because we had a brilliant MotoGP race last year with with Valentino Rossi and Mark Marquez um, battling for the win. Rossi, of course, winning it. Um, and, and as we mentioned earlier in the show, that was his last MotoGP win to this day. Um, so he'll be wanting to change that um and of course the handshake between the two in part ferme which um drew cheers and kind of sighs of relief um for all most gp fans that weekend that they that was the first time they kind of sort of buried the hatchet since the pang of the year before um yeah but um but in terms of this year's race there's a lot of caution from the yamaha team uh, and with good reason because um valentino rossi has been keen to point out that 
Catalonia over the years has become an increasingly low grip surface um, for MotoGP bikes. And the last time MotoGP went to a low grip surface was Jerez, where the Yamahas were not seen at all. Exactly. Rossi yeah. is concerned about that, isn't he? Yeah, it, it was a great post that David Emmett put up on um, on MotoMatters.com earlier today, talking about the state of Catalonia. That the track basically needs relaying at this point. Like it, it's it's its surface is very old. It's kind of why the F1 races there have such a high amount of tire wear. Is that it's a it's a very old surface. It needs relaying. It needs completely doing over. And if the whole weekend feels like a bodge job in terms of, you know, circuit health, circuit safety, and, you know, the, the this new Catalonia and this new chicane, they had to bodge in there now because of safety and obviously because of Solomon's passing. It, it's, we've had a year since it happened. And obviously last year it was a good solution um, to a, a very short-term quick fix. So obviously a, a very awful problem. But this year they've had a year since and it's, Still, it's, it's arguably worse now because apparently that last chicane is even tighter. So um, it will probably bring Marquez and the Hondas back into play because they like it when the track is slower. But um, as you say, a low grip surface doesn't help Yamaha at all. The Yamaha like a grippy circuit. They don't like having to dig around and use the engine to to power their way out of corners. It's not, and that's what Honda do so well. So low grip circuits play into Honda's hands. Um, so Rossi has every right to be concerned, given the bike he's riding. And yeah, Catalonia kind of needs some help, but they can't really draw the money up to fix it. So yeah, it's, it's all sorts of mess by yeah, now. It's kind of like the Yamahas just thrive when when you have grip. The Yamahas are, are so strong, but when there isn't grip, the Hondas then come to the fore because it kind of levels the playing field a little bit. Um, and you know, Mark Marquez just seems to thrive on low grip track surfaces. How often do we see when we go to new circuits and the, the track's all dirty on Friday morning and Marquez just goes out and blitzes them? Um, yeah, you know, he, he's so good at this kind of scenario. So this could be an opportunity for Mark Marquez, but we will see uh, as the weekend unfolds. We will return next week for episode 17 uh, of Bike Live to review everything that happens at the Barcelona Grand, uh, the Catalan Grand Prix weekend. We hope everyone uh, stays safe given what happened there last year. We hope this Grand Prix passes off without incident and gives us plenty of entertainment to talk about um, next week. Um, between now and then, do check out episode 89 of Motorsport 101 and by the time uh, you hear this, um, we'll be uh, uh, fast approaching episode 90 uh, of Motorsport 101 into the nervous 90s um, uh, for Motorsport 101. <laughs> Um, 10 away from uh, Dre being able to raise his bat um, on uh, on YouTube uh, in the future. Um, <laughs> but um, episode 90, um, loaded show. Not that you ever need any encouragement to go two hours, Dre, as you found to your cost this week. Um, but um, hmm. not only IndyCar, but also the Formula One um, circus returns for one of its most popular venues, the Canadian Grand Prix in Montreal. Yeah, keep an eye out for that. We're probably going to do a hangout for that one live on YouTube as well. Because we, we've we've had a tradition on uh, me, me and King. We've always done Canada. It's one of our favourite tracks on the calendar. It's it's a the circuit is Gilles Villeneuve. It's a fantastic circuit. Great venue for an F one race. It's, it's my time, personal time for a race as well. Seven in the evening. Yes. Yeah, yeah, perf- yeah um, We love it here. It's 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 our it's our favourite track on. It's my it's certainly my personal favourite track on the calendar. And it, it has a habit of producing really good races. Sometimes simplicity really is the best way of going about it. But yeah, very exciting Canadian Grand Prix. Well, Mercs have been playing the underdog card all the way through this weekend. They're saying they're the underdogs now. They reckon Ferrari are the favourites and they're waiting on upgrades. And uh, both guys love this place. Hamilton's won here four times prior. Vettel's had a lot of awful luck going on around here in the past. Like, And for me as a Vettel fan, I really, yes. really want this one i want a canada win he wants this more than he wanted a jonathan ray win at donaldson (laughs) exactly i want that same level of emotional body blow to hit hamilton on one of his strongest circuits but yeah this like last year we had that tremendous almost like time attack between hamilton and vettel in the second half of that race and it could very well be the same again here so definitely keep an eye on it we'll have that and of course the indycar texas 600 this weekend as well and if you saw what happened in part two last year one of the great IndyCar finishes of all time on the over between James Hinchcliffe, Tony Kanaan, Simon Pagano, and Graham Rahal, who would win that race that day. If you haven't seen it, go out of your way to YouTube and thank me later. But um, yeah, we're doing that again, and it's going to be an, it's a it's a resurfaced track, um, higher banking. Apparently, the cars can now run five wide. Uh-oh. Made a good Lord help. Made a good Lord help us all. So that. 
we'll, we'll all be covered, and obviously the news as well, on episode 90 of Motorsport 101 this time next week. Yeah, and I'm just uh, checking the uh, calendar. Yeah, you also have the uh, Berlin E-Prix doubleheader. Uh, this week. Oh yes, uh, oh, they're, wow. they're, they're racing twice, um, both on Saturday and Sunday. So um, yeah, two Formula E races, a Formula One, uh, for two Formula E races, a Formula One race, and uh, the Texas 600 in IndyCar as well. It's a loaded episode 90 of Motorsport 101 um, next week, most likely Wednesday or Thursday of next week before Bike Live rounds off the week as you head into the weekend. Um, my thanks to Andre Harrison and to Rebecca James as we get the band back together um, this week on Bike Live. Um, we'll talk to you all again this time next week here on Motorsport. 101. We look forward to your company then. Until then, for the three of us, it's bye bye.